trade itself. The second issue I really want to raise is the impact of the so-called fourth industrial revolution. That is to say, issues like um, automation, uh, the impact of integration of technologies on uh, social efficiencies, but also that creates a lot of social disruption, um, which is brought about by industrial change. The questions I hope our panelists today will be able to address are, firstly, are we doing enough, are countries doing enough to protect whatever advantage they may have in meeting the challenges of a new, already emerged economy? Um, and in particular, um, what is the United States doing to further its um, competitive edge in innovation and creative destructionism? Is it enough uh, for the United States to really focus on creating trade barriers to ensure its global growth? Or should it be focused more on investing and um, pursuing policies that will ensure growth from within? Um, and where sh and if that is the case, if there should be a change in investment policies, well, what should those priorities be? Um, are th is there, for lack of a better word, is are there industrial policies that countries can pursue to further their own economic gain? Those are um, some of the issues I hope our speakers will be able to touch upon. And I would like to ask. Um, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our speakers in brief in the order that they will be speaking. First up is our only male uh, panelist here. It's um, Rob Atkinson, who is the founder. Uh, uh, do you, you're man enough to take it. That's great. Um, um, lean in, okay, lean in. Um, Rob Atkinson is founder and president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, or ITIF. Um, he is a uh, author of many books, uh, including Big is Beautiful, Be Debunking the Mythology of Small Business. Um, he's also worked on in the administrations of Clint, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, and on the Commission on Workers, Communities, and Economic Change in the New Economy, National Surface Transportation Infrastructure Financing Commission. Uh, Commission. Uh, he's actually participated in a number of government um, initiatives, and he's been a key player in defining some of these issues that are at the forefront of economic growth. Um, you can read more about his very impressive bio um, in the handouts that we have in front of you. Um, second will be my colleague, um, Eleanor Powell, who is the director of the Anticipatory Intelligence Lab with the Science and Technology Innovation Program here at the Wilson Center. Um, she is a specialist in government, governance and democratization of converging technologies, and she leads the uh, um, AI lab uh, through analyzing and comparing how transformative technologies such as artificial intelligence and genome editing ra raise new opportunities and challenges for health, security, economics, and governance. Um, and finally, our speaker in the box. <laughs> uh, pr um, hopefully, we will be able to continue to have her online is Sam Sachs, who is a senior fellow in the Technology Policy Program at CSIS. She leads CSIS's uh, China Cyber Outlook, which analyzes China's evolving ICT government system. And prior to joining CSIS, she launched the industrial uh, in, uh, sorry, she launched the industrial cyber business for Siemens in Asia, and she's also worked at Booz Allen Hamilton and Defense Group Inc. amongst other places. So, uh, with that, I'd like to ask Rob to start us off. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, um, I think that. We are, we're poised at an inflection point for trade policy, but not so much for the re partly for the reason we all hear about and know about, which is um, I think you can have a difference of views. I'm, I'm kind of more on Derek's view, I, side. I think the reason why we've had this response is because we have let China do uh, uh, basically run roughshod over WTO principles and rules and uh, to the detriment of the global economy, and people have finally said enough is enough. Um, 
But I think there's another deeper and more structural factor, and that is um, I don't really like the term fourth industrial revolution. I think it's not, it's for kind of ahistorical. <coughs> But I was at a session yesterday that the Bertelsmann Foundation had, and, and, and I was so pleasantly surprised because someone actually used the same terminology I use, which was the finance, ministry of Lithu finance minister of Lithuania talked about the sixth wave, which is actually what's going on. So if you don't follow this stuff, basically Schumpeterian long wave theory, this is Joseph Schumpeter, theories of innovation come in these sort of 40 or 50 year cycles. They're big transformative, they're what economists call general purpose technologies. These are technologies that fundamentally decline in price and improve in, in quality very rapidly and they um, are able to be used in many, many different industries and many, many different functions. Um, and they have big GDP impacts. So if you have a technology system that has all three of those, it's a general purpose technology. I, I would argue we're in the early, early stages of the S-curve of this new GPT, which you can call sort of AI, robotics, uh, data, all that package, and genomics is part of that. Um, and that, that's going to begin to have sort of two, three big impacts, I think, that relate to both domestic and trade policy. Uh, the first is on firm size, so I can't do anything. I think I have one more week in which I can allow myself to, no matter what the topic is, put a pitch in for my new book, so, which is only two weeks old. So uh, Big is Beautiful, uh, Debunking the Mythology, the Myth of Small Business, MIT Press with my colleague Mike Lynn. But one of the points we make in the book is we look at how technology is enabling larger firm size in many, many different industries. So think about, it's obviously think about retail. Um, but, you know, bank size has gone up, and I don't mean big banks, I mean just bank size overall has gone up, insurance, uh, logistics, uh, many, many different industries now are able to capture greater economies of scale because of these new technologies, and um, AI and, and, and is going to make that even, even easier. Um, secondly, it's making these services, making these output much more tradable. So, you know, in the old economy that we've sort of all been through, really trade was, you know, it was largely goods. There, there, was a, there was a services agreement, but it was really, it's always been on the side, and, tr and trade and good has been the centerpiece. I would argue that trade and services is going to really be the engine of trade for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years uh, if we get the rules right, and that's going to have big, big impacts, uh, positive impacts. And the third would be... Um, that these technologies are really transforming every sector. I alluded to that at the beginning. So agriculture, uh, real estate, um, uh, banking, uh, wholesale trade, uh, healthcare, you name it. So what's th what does that mean? I think for a couple things. One, um, for domestic policy, I think it means that countries need to have a coherent strategy about how to both advance uh, the innovation part of that, the industries who are doing that, but also the adoption of that by all sectors. And so I think in that, in some ways, the U.S. is okay positioned. Uh, we've cut our R&D budget to below where we were prior to Sputnik. So think about that for a second. Uh, 1956, there was no Sputnik, um, and that's where we are today as a share of federal R&D to GDP. That, uh, you should all go out on the street after this talk and go in front of the White House and hold up signs because that, to me, is <laughs> so unbelievably atrocious that we've gotten into that position. So clearly the U.S. could and should do that. Um, there, there are other things that we, we could and should do, uh, more CS, computer science education, uh, more focus on helping industries transform, et cetera. Okay. But what does it mean for trade and particularly for Southeast Asia nations? Um, I think the biggest factor in Southeast Asian nations is that they've bought into this, and, and let me be clear, happy to acknowledge that it perhaps was an okay, if not good strategy. I'm stipulating it's not anymore. And that's they bought into this notion that the way you grow is through export-led industries moving up the value chain. That's, that's what Southeast Asian nations do. That's what China is in the process of trying to do. Um, the problem with that is twofold. One is it is a has a, it is a dead end fairly quickly, which is we see from Japan and Korea. Uh, and China will learn that in 20 years. Uh, this is a dead end strategy. You can only go so far with it, and then eventually you run out of things to do. You cannot keep exporting your way to growth. There's a limit to it. And increasingly now, we're refusing to be the, the, the import, uh, substitute, in, import uh, last resort of the world. So that strategy has another failure to it. 
But why that strategy is so bad is because it runs out of ways to raise productivity. So let me give you a few examples. Um, <coughs> Uh, Japan was raising its productivity. Jap you look at Japan in 1950, abysmal productivity compared to the U.S. All the way up to 2004, Japan was closing its productivity gap with the United States, largely on an export-led strategy. So if you look at their exports industries, they were much more productive than ours. Their steel's 30 percent more productive. Their electronics was about 30 percent more productive. But um, since 2004, that gap has gone down the other way. So they have grown their productivity more slowly than the United States, and Japanese per capita income has, has become less as a share of U.S. per capita income, largely because they have all these industries in Japan that are protected from global competition and have not embraced innovation. So their retail sector is really unproductive, their wholesale trade sector, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Korea is even worse. Um, so Total factor productivity as well as labor productivity grew in Korea the fastest of any country probably in world history ever. Probably no other country will break that record. So from 1950 to, say, 2000, just Korea was a miracle. But, or to 95, I should say. But then if you look at from 95 to close to the present, Korean productivity actually grew more slowly than U.S. productivity. So that you have to really work hard to do that when, you're, uh, when your per capita income is about 60%. Because if you're a low income, they're not low income, if they're a medium to high income compared to, um, compared to us, you should be able to grow your productivity faster than the global leader. Global leaders have the hardest time growing productivity. Laggards have the easiest time because they just adopt existing stuff. Um, why is Korea, and I use them as an example because you, you can substitute almost any Asian, Southeast Asian country and you'll get the exact same results. So a couple of stats on Korea and then I'll wrap up. Um, in the 2000s, Korean productivity in agriculture and manufacturing was 5.4 and 6.5 percent a year. I mean, phenomenal rates of productivity. But they had declining productivity in real estate and business activities and finance. Uh, transport was 0.3 percent a year. So you have this dualized economy, and that's really what I think Southeast Asian economies are. They're dualized economies where you have part of it that's this great engine, highly innovative. You look at companies like Samsung and, 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 and others. And then you look at the rest of the economy, and it's just not very productive at all. Uh, in Korea, for example, services productivity is 45 percent manufa of manufacturing compared to an OECD level of 86 percent. So most OECD countries don't have these dualized economies. They have innovation in all sectors. Southeast Asian countries tend to have innovation and productivity in manufacturing. Um, now, the problem is that that's not by accident. It's not like somehow these countries just don't know how to do this. They consciously have policies to restrict growth and innovation in these sectors, partly for domestic political reasons. They, they like to protect these small little dinky businesses. Uh, Korea has, for example, um, I forget the number. I think it was 2 million firms. I have it in the book. 2 million f small firms um, in like 2019, sorry, in 2002, and only 200 of them grew to be big. And by big, I meant more than 500 workers. So <laughs> they have all these first small firms that never grow, that are massively subsidized by the state, and more importantly, massively protected by trade rules. So there's a Peterson Institute study that looked at the tariff equivalent of services restrictions that Southeast Asian countries place. And so, in other words, all these rules and regulations and sort of if you make that into an equivalent of what would a tariff be to get you that same level of protection from competition, uh, that number in Indonesia is 70 percent. So think about having a tariff on 70 percent on banking and retail and personal business services. Philippines, 55 percent. Malaysia, 29 percent. Korea, 25 percent. Japan, 17 percent. U.S., 6 percent. So U.S. not perfect, but little teeny. So these countries fundamentally don't want to engage in services trade liberalization. And then the last point is, and, and maybe uh, Eleanor, you'll talk about this, but um, one of the big areas that's really important now as we move to a data-driven economy is cross-border data flows. And we wrote a report last year, my colleague Nigel Cor uh, Corey on it. Um, you look at these kind of Indonesia, probably the, well, no, uh, never mind. Anytime you say the worst country on this stuff, it's always China. So leave China aside. 
Indonesia, the second worst country in the world on cross-border data restrictions. Uh, this is just pure mercantilism. It has nothing to do with any legitimate policy goal the government has other than mercantilist protectionism. Malaysia, uh, South Korea, you can move data, at least in South Korea, you can move data out of the country if you get an affirmative permission from the citizen to do it. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, hey, could we move your data outside the country? How many Koreans are going to allow that? Uh, Vietnam, um, so again, data localization policy. So I think if, the, if Southeast Asian countries really want to grow, uh, the idea that they can do it by the old model, and the old model to me has run out of steam. It's just, just it's a dead end. Um, you know, they can eke out a little bit more out of it, sure. Uh, they're going to have to fundamentally transform their economy through this next wave of innovation. That means transforming every sector, and that has to imply, include uh, serious trade liberalization and services. Harsh words. Thank you so much. Um, Eleanor, I think we have a PowerPoint yeah. presentation. See, technology, when it works, is great. Um, do you have a So good afternoon. Uh, it's an extreme pleasure for me to be part of this panel in such a good company. Thank you so much, Yoko and uh, Jacques, for this opportunity. So my talk will focus on a topic that you see on the cover of about every magazine and newspaper at this point, artificial intelligence or AI. Some call it the next electricity, the next enlightenment. Others call it the system that only dreams in total darkness, the black box. As I like to say, um, AI is a set of technologies too powerful for humankind to refuse. And so my talk will center first on AI as this powerful data optimization platform within te tech convergence, what we often call the fourth industrial revolution, and we may indeed um, not agree on, on the label. Then in a second phase, I will unveil the impact of AI convergence on policy governance from different perspectives, from the private sector, and then from national and international legal systems. And as an intro, um, I would like to share with you a vision that I recently imagined in an opinion. And I say vision, but the main concept is actually close to reality, coming close to reality under the, under the impulse of AI and tech convergence. So here it is. Imagine the attributes of a new AI citizen. They look like this. Scientists, patients, congressmen, employees, everyone will be monitoring their DNA on shared cloud labs. AI platforms connected to our smartphones will analyze this biological data on the fly and will be integrated to our most strategic technical systems, including smart cities and smart hospitals. Facial recognition, optogenetics, and biosensors capturing our faces or biometrics or vital signs and emotions will be part of the city brain, a comprehensive cognitive network that rates everyone's interactions and behaviors. And if millions of citizens were streaming this data to the cloud, uh, they would build the most powerful data set the world has ever known for precision medicine. Um, at the same time, the same data could fuel precision surveillance, cyber espionage, or cyber warfare. And hackers could use deep learning to understand how to impact the population's health and well-being. So our genetic identity acquires a new life on the internet. We enter the age of the Internet of Living Things. Now, this scenario I just shared with you epitomizes the tech convergence of the 21st century, and I'm convinced of that. This, this is going to be the tech convergence of the 21st century. It's going to merge our physical, digital, and biological lives. And our genomes, brains, and bodies are no exception. Accelerated by a few dozen multinationals in the US and in China, this convergence remains somehow intangible. It kind of escapes our understanding. So let me picture it for you. You have heard of the Internet of Things, right? So the Internet of Things, the pervasive networks of sensors collecting data within our homes and cities, is slowly morphing into an Internet of Living Things, where genes, cells, vital signs um, combine with computer code. Connected to our smartphones, medical sensors inside and outside the body, Fitbit, 
variety of other sensors that exist. Uh, implants and portable genomic sequencers, the size of a USB stick. You can, geno you can sequence any genome in the jungle, Nigeria, you know, in during an, an Ebola crisis. We now have this capacity of sequencing on site. So all of those devices are increasingly feeding data into the IoT. And when optimized, this trove of data provides information superiority in economics and innovation. You can just think of precision medicine, smart cities, smart hospitals, all sectors that will create invaluable um, uh, wealth for the future and competitive advantage. Yet such massive data sets also create complex, lasting cyber vulnerabilities. Now we see in this convergence, AI is emerging from the confluence of two scientific waves. First, you have computer scientists developing algorithms that can recognize patterns within massive amounts of data, with supercomputing efficiency, and sometimes now without supervision. So at its core, AI is a very powerful data optimization platform. That's how we can define it at this point. At the same time, geneticists and neuroscientists are decoding data related to our genomes and brains, learning about genetics, cognitions, and neurons, emotions, and behaviors. And the combination of the combined optimization of biometrics, behavioral, genomics, and neural data is gonna, is gonna give rise to a new wave of AI, algorithms that can successfully analyze us, nudge us, and communicate with us. That's what we call affective computing. You see some of that on the on this slide already. You, you already have companies that are storing emotions, pictures of faces, uh, facial frames into their databases to be able to tailor advertisement. In the future, it could be tailoring a lot of other processes, a lot of other services. Um, so this new wave of AI will transform services and invade every major industry from decoding the secrets inside our genomes, to assisting in city surveillance, traffic monitoring, predictive policing. AI, as you understand, is a powerful engine of innovation within our data-driven economies. Yet, AI will also drastically weaken the distinction between what we consider public data and personal data, very intimate data about yourself. And while the technology will certainly alter our notion of privacy, it could also offer corporations, hackers, governments, new ways to control and monitor populations. It's a new form of biopower. You all know Foucault and his doctrine of biopower. It's a merger of cyber power and biopower. So let me, go go I'm gonna go a step further and give you a few concrete snapshots of how this form of intrusive data computing um, invades our public and our personal lives and is being deployed in the US and in China. So the US still remains at the forefront of AI innovation from Amazon using cameras and sensors in its shop to Facebook harnessing deep learning to spot suicidal behaviors online. Surveillance is also reaching the, work the workplace as a, a US company has already um, implanted some employees with microchips. It's so much easier when you are late in the morning. So across the country, police departments are also building unregulated uh, databases using facial recognition systems for predictive policing. And this practice already impact over 117 million Americans. In healthcare, think of Google DeepMind. Google DeepMind was illegally provided access to 1.6 million uh, UK patient records. Now, as you understand, AI technologies will not just be tailored to consumers. Governments and military forces will benefit significantly from the deployment of AI to connect information superiority with economic and military power. So take, for instance, China. Following its doctrine of civil-military fusion, China is becoming an early adopter of AI surveillance technologies within smart cities, but also potentially for cyber intelligence. And when it comes to ubiquitous surveillance, China, China's tech giant Alibaba is investing deeply in what they call the city brain, city brain technologies, deploying millions of cameras equipped with facial recognition. And so databases of faces, genomes, financial and personal information are connected to rate credit, jobs, and the loyalty of citizens towards uh, the state. 
Another Chinese company, CloudWork, is using facial recognition to track individuals' behaviors and assess their predisposition to committing a crime. The Shenzhen company, iCarbonics, in the health sector, is developing software that can learn to detect useful patterns between individuals' biological, behavioral, and psychological data. All of this through uh, a phone app. So we're slowly, in China, merging towards a new system of social credit based on a form of pervasive computation. As Hob was saying, it's a general purpose technology. It's pervasive computation that can be harnessed within civilian and military context. Uh, this convergence of AI with cyber and biopower leads almost naturally to a crucial domain, which is a nexus between AI, bio, and cybersecurity. And for instance, um, smart cities present an invitation for cyber hackers. They are actually a security vulnerability that could lead to precise, collective, and personalized attacks. A year ago, uh, personal data of over 200,000 Malaysian organ donors were stolen to create fake identities. And so often, we fail to actually define a comprehensive strategy to protect personal and biometrics data in the cyberspace. Uh, the FDA warns that cyber attacks involve not only hospital records at this point, but um, health devices, um, so, you know, a pacemaker, and health applications. And beyond healthcare, genomic sequencing companies are also the next, ta the next target. So you see on this slide Quest Diagnostic. Quest Diagnostic is a company that runs toxicology analysis for the workplace. So they have your social security number, eventually a blood sample, maybe your urine, I mean, a lot of personal data. And uh, they were hacked in 2016 and robbed of 30,000 patients' data. So the collective threat posed by cyber attack on our tech and AI infrastructure shouldn't be neglected, and it's kind of neglected, neglected at this point. AI is inherently dual use, and therefore AI system will also be used to harness, to, to launch, and to defend against cyber attack. So think of AI as a very good classifier. It can recognize patterns. So AI system could recognize patterns of attack, ransomware, DDoS, and mitigate their effect. But it's dual use, so you can also consider the same AI computation used to decode encryption, automate global hacking campaign, uh, and exploit us by forging speech and, and images. It doesn't end here. There is another uh, potential type of attack that I find extremely complex and interesting because it's difficult to detect. It's kind of a slow motion. So imagine this issue of um, cyber poisoning or poisoning attack. So what if malicious actors decide to corrupt the data sets used by AI system to optimize our smart cities, biotech supply chain, or critical infrastructure, energy? Um, there might be serious long-term negative impacts from introducing functional noises into those databases. Imagine introdu introducing noises into hospital records, into genomics databases, into a biotech supply chain that produces cancer treatments, antibiotics, vaccines. And those are all... Uh, very, very important issues. You could imagine also introducing noise into recognition systems for self-driving cars. So, you know, that's, that's one risk we are really uh, under, we are facing. So we've seen with the manipulation of social media platforms only a peak, a peak of what could happen, not only in the US, but also in more fragile states. So this dive I did um, at the nexus of AI and cybersecurity raises a host of issues, but one in particular, the crucial role that data optimizing companies play in promoting our national security. And that's, that's completely, that's often forgotten. If you followed the Facebook debate, uh, you could see that was uh, kind of a forgotten argument. So recently on the Hill, the CEO, the CEO of Facebook presented his company as the last line of defense cyber defense in an ongoing arms race with Russia and others seeking to spread in disinformation and manipulate economic and political systems in the US and beyond. So what, what Mark Zuckerberg was saying between the lines is that only companies with access to the, to the best algorithm, but even more importantly to the biggest and highest quality data sets, will be able to develop the AI models driving innovation forward. 
And because countries with leading AI data, uh, with leading data platforms and leading AI algorithms will have the most flourishing economies, these big data and tech platforms are playing a role more important than ever in our national security. And we have to balance that with our expectations for privacy and our expectations for the respect of uh, civil liberties. In this AI augmentation race, China is one of the rising powers, playing, uh, planning to become an AI and DNA superpower by 2030. And to this end, Beijing has kept um, American tech giants out of the Chinese market for years. Uh, Beijing has acquired US tech capital and also invest massive resources into developing its own strategic collaboration with national champions like Baidu, Tencent, and Alibaba. So in this economic security and policy context, the question becomes how to rely on and protect, but also challenge and govern the rising tech platforms that often adopt permissionless innovation when it comes to our privacy, but also constitute a, a crucial security asset, a competitive advantage for our nations. Now, what does it mean for national and international legal and policy systems? Well, private uh, tech platforms whose commercial and political influences exist transnationally will make global governance and coordination increasingly complex for national and international, and international authorities. And you see that with the UN. You see the UN trying to find its footing, for example, in how to govern some of the uh, uh, current issues across borders. So those data and tech platforms could create a dissymmetry of power and tensions within and between nations. Such political tensions could have serious effect from weakening national cohesion to preventing global governance of an AI augmentation race without borders. Some government might choose to exploit AI for new forms of control, for instance, implementing ubiquitous and precise surveillance. How do we monitor this? How do we intervene in such an exploitation of technology uh, at a global level? Eventually, the ability of public authorities to adopt agile policy responses will force them to reinvent new ways to collaborate with businesses and with uh, civil society. Otherwise, the horizon is pretty grim. Government could fail to balance the use of new technologies and fail to capture um, the benefits of innovation. They could, they could prove unable to adapt to the velocity and the scope and the wide impacts um, of this new tech convergence driven by AI. Shifting power dynamics could create new security concerns. Those are going to be cyber security concerns. Global inequalities may grow and societies may fragment. So to conclude, uh, these implications will concern beyond the private and the public sectors, every one of us. The ongoing AI revolution will not only trans transform our lives, but ourselves. Uh, the ongoing, you know, it, it's going to lead an evolution, the evolution of our value systems based on privacy, agency, identity, and equality. And such evolution will diverge in degree and, and speed according to different, different cultures. In China, you might have, um, you know, different accepted notion of privacy or, or breach of privacy. Such evolution um, will raise tension between the need for inclusive global governance and the need for more tailored legal system tailored to um, a, a cultural specific context. So we may need to reframe also the permeability between civil and military applications of AI. Uh, we may need to be able to establish guidelines at national and international level that can govern, that can regulate the deployment of AI technologies in the civilian and in the military context, because this capacity to prototype, iterate from one to the other, um, uh, you know, reframe our notion of civilian safety and, and security. So we'll stop here. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Eleanor, for that um, very comprehensive and yet sobering um, yeah. outlook. <laughs> um, Sam, w you, we still see you. Hopefully, we can uh, connect, continue to connect with you. So, yeah. Away. And I apologize in advance if I drop, so I'll, I'll get as far as I can here. Um, what I thought I would do is do a, a deep dive into what is going on in China on these fronts. Um, first, talk about the top-down view, what are Beijing's aspirations, 
Um, but also keep it in mind that plans are just that, they're aspirations, um, and that there is also a sort of bottom-up view that we have to take into consideration when we look at the reality of emerging technologies in China. I also want to talk about what the Chinese government is doing in terms of cyber governance and building out a robust legal framework around regulating emerging technologies. And lastly, what the policy implications are from the U.S. perspective, what's working, what's not, what we could do better as we're responding to what China is doing. So let's look at what the reality is in China. I think that the Made in China 2025 plan has gotten a lot of attention. Um, but it's really part uh, of a much broader framework in terms of what the leadership is thinking um, about emerging technologies. There's a concept in Chinese, Wang Luo Qian Guo, which um, I've worked with a number of other analysts to translate, and our translation of this and the plans that come along with it are China's aspirations to build the country into a cyber superpower. We had a lot of internal debate about is this a strong power? Is this a national power? But our assessment is that this is the leadership of Xi Jinping is, is trying to build China into a cyber superpower. And what does that mean? There's a tremendous focus on the information and communications technology ICT space um, and creating an independent technology base, both the software and the hardware that undergirds the internet. Um, Xi Jinping gave an opening speech at the 19th Party Congress in October, which is the twice in a decade convening of China's top leadership, in which for the first time in an opening speech at this kind of event, he specifically um, mentioned AI and digital China. It's really rare to call out those specific sectors at such a high level meeting, but I think that it's indicative of the fact that this vision is coming from the highest levels in the Chinese bureaucracy. And you can debate, is this individually coming from Xi Jinping as a, a single leader, or is this more of a um, consensus-based leadership circle around him that's enabling it? But regardless, this is a mandate coming from the highest levels. Um, and it's part of a broader vision for China's economic restructuring. So moving away from investing in heavy traditional industry is to these value-added sectors that Rob mentioned. Um, I think it's also important to mention that these plans are, are aspirations, right? And if we look at the AI development plan, um, which has also received a lot of attention here, it's important to recognize that the Chinese leadership themselves um, has talked about this as an aspiration and something that actually is being driven largely by private companies in China. Um, and so recently there was a dialogue around this plan and um, the folks that were really involved with drafting it said, look, you know, we are going to actually have to iterate this plan because things are moving so fast that like we can write a top down blueprint, but the reality on the ground is changing. So we're probably going to have to adjust it every four year, every few years, even before we get to these markers of 2020, 2030, when China is supposedly going to be a leader in AI. Um, and I think that that's important because it it's a reminder of the fact that you can have a top down system, but also um, a very vibrant commercial private sector led um, development. Um, situation going on. And um, I think, you know, Alibaba was mentioned as an example. And just to put a little bit of meat on the bone about how exactly these technologies are really, you know, impacting um, business operations there. And Rob mentioned in his book, the idea that AI is sort of enabling the scale of these firms. I was at Alibaba headquarters in Hangzhou recently, um, talking with some senior folks there about what exactly they're doing with AI. And they're you know, using AI across all aspects of the business from transactions, from the logistics network, which, you know, if you spend any time in China and you've used e-commerce there, you know that it's just sort of mind-blowingly fast, the speed, the scale of what they're able to do. And they're using AI to make those services, to make those processes much more efficient. Um, so, for example, the the quantity and the speed of payments that, that Alibaba um, processes. On their peak day for shopping, Alibaba, I think it was something like 260,000 transactions per second. So compare that to Visa on Cyber Monday after Thanksgiving, only 24,000 transactions per second. So this is the way in which these technologies are really enabling um, you know, a, 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 a vast changes across, across the landscape. Um, 
So that's sort of just to sort of give you some a, a concrete example of, of what this is what this looks like. There's a, an internal tension right now in the system where you have a tremendous focus from the leadership on advancing these technologies like AI, like data, like IoT. At the same time, there's a focus on building out a very comprehensive legal framework around cyberspace and emerging technologies. And China's cybersecurity law is the centerpiece of this effort. It's not the only piece of it. You know, there are dozens and dozens of regulations, of standards that accompany this. And in my view, this is the most comprehensive governing structure for cyberspace and emerging technologies of any country around the world, because it brings under one mantle not not just regulating online content, um, but industrial policy in ways that you can, that creating a more secure and controllable domestic IT base, um, as well as data flows. Um, and this is all under one, one rubric. And, and, and Rob has mentioned this as, you know, as, as a, 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 an area in which um, you could have some tensions with, with innovation. And I think that there is a lot of debate inside the Chinese bureaucracy where I think we tend to think of it as sort of a monolithic entity, but the reality is you have different stakeholders. Some are really pushing the sort of security elements of this cyberspace governance system, but in ways that are actually at odds with the development of these new technologies. Um, and data localization is a, is a prime example of that, right? So the cybersecurity law um, has very strict provisions about the kind of security assessments that certain kinds of data will need to undergo before they're being exported. Um, but Chinese companies like Alibaba, like Tencent, have actually pushed back on some of those provisions because these are companies that are trying to operate globally and can't conduct global transactions if they can't send data across borders. So that's sort of where I think even inside the Chinese bureaucracy, we're still seeing thriving debate um, about, about these tensions. Um, so what is, what, is, what does this all mean for the United States as China looks to you know, be a leader in this, a cyber superpower on par with the United States? Um, I think that Look, there are real industrial policy, real national security and commercial problems connected with China's approach um, in ways that are impacting market access for U.S. companies. Um, we also have. You know, oh. OK, um, it was. Right. Well, um, Sam, um, if you can hear me, we've lost you. So unfortunately, we're going to continue the conversation without you. I'm so sorry. Um, I do want to, before we open up to questions, and hopefully Sam will be able to finish her um, comments um, before the end of the, our session, I, I do want to um, point out one of the interesting, uh, we've covered so much ground here, but one of the things that really has been made time and time again is that the United States is a leading um, uh, power and when it comes to um, AI and emerging technologies. And at the same time, Sam really articulated the fact that this top-down approach in China is not um, at perhaps an adequate way to ensure that countries remain um, at, at the uh, forefront. Um, one of the striking comments that I heard um, w during the Facebook hearing last week was that some of the members of Com Congress were seemingly um, very unaware or not really understanding what they were asking and that they weren't really understanding what the potential and what the um, issues of Facebook and security issues um, and uh, data protection may or may not be. So my question to you, maybe I can throw this first to Rob and then um, Eleanor can follow up, is if not a top-down approach, what is the way we can ensure governance that on the one hand ensures private sector growth and on the other hand does allow for consumers to benefit from this innovation? Uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't frame it that way. I think um, I think we're doing exactly what we should be doing. You know, I don't see that there's a problem in the U.S. Um, if you look and see why, why is the U.S. the global leader in AI, uh, and Europe is not, and won't be, uh, 
for a bunch of different reasons, but one of the reasons in, in our view is they passed the G GDPR, which is an incredibly restrictive regulatory framework and really will limit companies in Europe uh, using data and applying an algorithm to it. The U.S., thankfully, has not gone down that path, so that's number one. Number two, our antitrust regime enables scale, and I think as Eleanor said, scale is important here. Scale is particularly important if we're going to challenge the Chinese. The Chinese have a Siamese twin of every one of our companies, and that <laughs> Siamese twin is backed by uh, a huge checkbook by MIIT or other uh, entities in China. And so, you know, the worst thing we could do would be to start telling, start bringing antitrust actions against our major players in this, uh, because at worst it would sort of break them up, but really what it would probably do would be to make them gun shy, make them less aggressive. So we can see that in U.S. history, again, talk about this in the book, uh, when the U.S. went after IBM uh, for mainframe domination, the end result was very clearly that three or four Japanese companies got significant global market share in Semi in, in, in mainframe computers um, because a IBM was looking under over its shoulder every single time it wanted to be aggressive there. We can't be aggressive. And I think that would be a huge, huge mistake. Um, we have to have big companies at scale in the U.S. who don't mind just trying to win uh, if we're going to, you know, stay ahead of, of, of China, and China and Chinese companies. When it comes to privacy, uh, I think it's really important to understand <laughs> so much of this is misunderstood. I mean, you look at that hearing and you're like, there's so many things Congress did, appeared not to understand. One of the fundamental things they didn't understand is, a, is a Facebook doesn't give your data to the, you know, to Procter & Gamble or, 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 or to Ford Motor Company. When Procter & Gamble wants to sell some washing machine detergent to somebody, they, they say, hey, at Facebook, have your algorithm find people who they, you think the algorithm might think wants to buy washing machine detergent. And then they just get an ad. So there's no employee at Facebook that says, you know, Rob Atkinson is likely to buy Tide. There's no employee ever knows that. And Procter & Gamble never knows that. So there's so much misunderstanding about this. Uh, and I really, I really worry that we're going to go down. We're going to another one, by the way, is um, who broke the law? Here? It's interesting. There's like, well, if we have the GDPR in the U.S., everything is going to be fine because then Facebook wouldn't have get, wouldn't have done this. It doesn't appear that Facebook broke the law. A European company and a European researcher broke the law. So, how many of you have ever gone over the speed limit? Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry, but didn't you know we have laws? So laws don't stop malefactors. What laws do is allow you to prosecute malefactors and limit the incentives of what they did. And I hope Europe or the UK is going to bring some serious cases. <laughs> but the case isn't about Facebook. It's about how somebody used that. So I just think we have to be careful. And the last thing would be really the main thing here, is, or one of the main things. Um, one thing I will give China a lot of credit for is they do put a lot of money into research into this space. Uh, they're training a lot of really great scientists and computer scientists and others here, and we're not. Um, and so we can't just complain about what China's doing. We also have to take serious action here. And I don't see any evidence of that. I mean, if you look at, it's not a partisan statement, but if you look at the Trump science budget, it, it didn't do that. Um, the congressional budgets are a little better, but they're still not doing that. If we were to fund our federal R&D uh, uh, portfolio at the rate we did in 1989 as a share of GDP, we'd have to put $110 billion a year more into that. Okay. So there's no way in God's name we're going to put $110 billion. And we'll be lucky if we, you know, we just bumped up the NIH budget by, I think, $4 billion. So I, you know, unless we're willing to do those kinds of big investments in the future, I don't see us, of, ultimately I see the Chinese overtaking us. But they're not there yet. But right. Ten years, and that would be. really be like a changing, a dramatic shift in the changing um, budget priorities, really. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Sam, we lost you, but I was wondering, <laughs> your backup, if you would like to bring your comments together before we have Eleanor follow up on Rob's comments. I think actually the last part of Rob's comments that I just caught 
captured in many ways some of the policy recommendations that I was going to say as well. Um, I, I really agree with those points from the U.S. response. The one thing I would add is I think that we need to take a much more targeted look at where the problems are with China. Um, and what I mean is, you know, this is a this is not a monolithic landscape, right? Right. And so we need to look at specifically where are the problems and where are they not, because otherwise I think we're going to hurt ourselves in the process. So just give you an example, you know, like when we think about um, about Chinese companies and the sort of national security risks of their investments and their equipment here, let's talk about specifically where those risks are. So when the U.S. government blocks Huawei handsets in the U.S., I would argue that handsets probably are not really a national security risk. If Huawei is getting into sort of the core internet backbone, yes, that is. But when we get into an environment where we're sort of like blocking handsets and we're in a tit for tat environment, when we're also considering sort of these blanket bans on Chinese investment in sectors, um, I think that we need to sort of step back and say, you know, where where are the real issues? Where are they not? So that we don't end up, you know, undermining our own abilities um, to to work in these areas. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, I would say, Shioko, we're kind of seeing, you know, emerge, um, an, an, I'm going to focus on AI, but an AI um, US-China duopoly. So what you see happening is that the rise of those tech platforms, or what we can call the platform economy, is really restructuring how we organize, you know, our services, how we organize our uh, industrial sectors. So that, that's something to, to consider. It's also based on a convergence of technologies. So um, you, you cannot really operate, you know, on public data being distinguished from personal data. It's really um, a kind of a systemic uh, impact with, a, with velocity and with really large scope. What you see flourishing in the US and in China is kind of a permissionless innovation model. So you have those big tech platforms that are um, building on their ongoing innovation further and further without really um, having to care too much about different regulation uh, linked to you know, either privacy or either um, other, other values we, we would want to uh, uh, foster in a more important way in this digital transformation. So they kind of, they kind of you know, go, go as, uh, as the flow and as the successes uh, come in. That's an interesting model. It's the opposite of where the EU is trying to go. Mm -hmm. So the um, the EU is trying to kind of reappropriate some levers by, um, you know, being at the forefront of governance, a more precautionary governance, and trying to to oppose this model of permissionless innovation. So you're what you're facing now. It's really this confrontation of two ways, um, two way of two ways of thinking about how we shape technological change to our shared values, or not. Uh, but it's working very well for both the U.S. and China. Yeah. What, that, what you see, what I distinguish between the two is that um, I think it's very interesting to see that in China you have this civil-military fusion doctrine, which means that anything you prototype in this civil, civilian context can be used in the military context. So it kind of reinforces both of those sectors. And what you see happening in the U.S. now is the um, Trump administration trying to negotiate that relationship with the private sector again. Mm. So um, there was an article recently saying, you know, Google should, Google should, um, uh, should buy in and help the troops. Uh, there should be uh, um, a form of contract or a social contract between the military industry and the private sector. And there are some resistance here in the U.S. for doing so while in China it's well implemented as a, as a doctrine that's really framing uh, mm -hmm. the strategy, the strategical plan. So I think that that's an interesting, you know, other kind of distinction. Uh, but permissionless is really what's driving this, this model for, for, um, for our data economies. In the future, something that maybe I would add to what Hub was saying is that right now you don't see any problem with having, you know, an ad about um, detergent mm -hmm. uh, if you need so. If in the future you get AI and affective computing and you get much more tailored mm. processes, you know, systems that are able to really understand what your emotional state is, what mm. your type of relationship inside your family are, like that really get at an affective relationship and at a form of social engineering, mm. then we may need to think about, um, you know, an adaptive governance for, for those issues. And where is that going to come from? I don't know. That that's really what we're kind of negotiating now. Does it come still from public authorities? Is it the liability or responsibility of the private sector? You know, can we put 
Mark Zuckerberg in front of those responsibilities or not? Or can we anticipate how those developments are going to uh, take shape? Uh, I think that's where, that's where it lies, in two foresight. How far is it going to go and, and who is going to be responsible in those more extreme cases? And can there be backlash by, um, the you can opt in, you can opt out, C can you? At some point you will not be able to opt out. If there is really an integration of your personal biometrics, you know, uh, all of your data inside the IoT, including your biological data, it's going to be very, very difficult to anonymize mm. those kind of data. Or then we really need to think right now about designing privacy enhancing mm. technology. You could do that with AI. You could work with AI on encrypted data set, but that requires more work, more research. Mm. And you have to push the private sector to do so if that's the shared value, you know, if that's the agreement or the consensus we, we go for. Mm. And we are at this stage of negotiating those those positions, basically. Shihoku, can I just say a few words about data privacy in China? Because I think yes. that there's actually a lot of interesting stuff going on there and probably also a lot of misconceptions about it outside of China. So China's actually in the process of building a very comprehensive data protection regulatory framework. Um, they came out with a standard in December called the Personal Information Security Specification. Um, and I've been in communication with the lead drafter of the standard. They actually really modeled this after GDPR as a model. Um, very comprehensive rules about consent involving use and collection of personal information. Um, I do, and I can talk specifically about some of the intricacies of that if there's interest. I think that there's just, there are two tracks to thinking about data privacy in China. The first is that, you know, under this standard, which fits under the larger cybersecurity framework, there are actually very robust rules that are coming, you know, on, on the books right now for how companies are handling Chinese user data. There's been also very, a lot of um, more demands for data, personal information protection by Chinese internet users. Um, just after the Facebook scandal, um, the CEO of Baidu came out and said, oh, Chinese users really are more willing to sacrifice privacy for convenience and services. And after he said that, there was a huge um, backlash on Chinese social media. Weibo conducted a poll. Um, there was like 12,000 people that just in, in a couple of days responded to the poll. And 90% of them said, no, we don't agree. He's really out of touch with this growing awareness about user privacy in China. But I do think that the way that they're thinking about privacy is very different from how we are thinking about it in the West. I think it's much more about concerns that private companies would misappropriate personal information, sell it on the black market to criminals. It's not really a concern about the government, per se, having that data. In fact, I've heard people talk about, I actually feel really comfortable with the government having my information. It's the private companies in China that I'm concerned about, right? So that's sort of the framework that they're thinking about it in. I also think that these new rules are focused on Chinese companies, not on the government. So you have this sort of dual track happening where... Oh. And it was quite very interesting as well. So unfortunately, we have lost Sam again. Um, why don't we... Um, we'll get Sam back when, when and if we do. Um, we can get back to her. Um, to finish her thought, um, but why don't we open up for questions? Um, there is a microphone. We are actually webcasting this, so if you could raise your hand. Yes. I'm wondering a little bit if we could discuss whether this really is you know, a Chinese versus American issue, or if it's more an issue of where do these different sector applications go? I mean, just to take one example, uh, Jack Ma has put in a $15 billion investment into something he calls the Damo Academy, which has cities, branches all over the world. So he is trying to create a sort of future back sort of university system so that everyone can look at it. I mean, I, I understand on the one side you're saying the interaction may be different between, say, Chinese government and US government, but then one thing that I'm impressed by in China is that the mass media is very curious about a lot of these things ahead of time mm -hmm. in the way that uh, US media isn't. So mm -hmm. 
I'm not sure I buy the idea that China's, uh, I buy the idea these are very dangerous things if enough people don't discuss uh, them ahead of time, but I'm not sure that, that there seems to be a bit of a dichotomy between China and America from the way you presented this, and I'm wondering if I'm hearing it right or not. What are the differences? Who wants to take it first? Well, I think one difference between us and China is you walk down the street in China and there are these posters that say, in, I'm paraphrasing, we need to innovate faster. You never would see that in the U.S. You know, when was the last time a politician that you know of talked about innovation? So I think the entire country has this commitment to innovation. When you have 25 percent of U.S. per capita income, you're, you're pretty motivated. We don't have that. We also have this arrogance in the U.S. that we're the leader and we always will be the leader. So I give them credit for that. I don't object to that. What I object to is how they're doing it, which is through, an, like, for example, Sam talked about the secure and controllable regime. The secure and controllable regime is a sham. It's an utter sham. It is designed as an excuse to not buy foreign products. Now, I'll, I know how much you all know that you should, you know, HP products and, and IBM products and Dell products, and these are not secure. So it's, uh, you know, so I think that's what we sh really should be concerned about. The secure and controllable thing has nothing to do with security in China. It has everything to do with keeping out foreign products because they claim they're not secure or controllable, which is completely wrong. I don't agree with that either. I don't think there are Ch Chinese companies are, are uh, look, I think our companies and European companies are global capitalists, multinational. They're, they're capitalists, they're global. You know, they have some loyalty to their home state. Chinese companies are, 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 are joined at the hip with the Chinese state. Uh, they, they are, they, 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 it's impossible to separate that. I'm not saying every one is run by the Communist Party, because that's certainly not the case. But they very, very much are looking. I'll tell you, I was in a meeting with Baidu and, and, uh, uh, in Beijing, and I, and I was talking to one of their senior AI officials or, you know, persons, and I asked him a question that was sort of related to privacy policy and like that, and he, and he refused to answer it. He turned to the Communist Party official to have the Communist Party official say what the Baidu position should be. So I guarantee you, you'd never in a million years have that in the U.S. You think, a, you think an American company would look to, well, let me see what the Department of Commerce thinks my position should be on this. <laughs> Uh, so it's just, it's a really different world. It's, it's not apples and oranges. I mean, it is apples and oranges. Okay, you're, you're all right. You're the government is not thinking socially a ahead. Uh, uh, I, I actually might prefer Facebook to be accountable to some social organization than just to itself. I, I, don't, I don't really buy, I don't know... I, I mean, I agree that this is if you trust if you trust the China, if you trust the Chinese government to protect your privacy, good luck. I much rather would have Facebook cons uh, accountable to no one else except its customers and its credibility because it has every incentive in the world to not misuse it or mistreat it. And by the way, the FTC can and has and you know is certainly capable of bringing cases against it because we have privacy rules. I, I want to actually follow up on the investment issue, and that is really a weakness um, for the United States, and specifically investing in human capital. We talk about um, labor shortage in Silicon Valley and you know, Facebook having this uh, lack of uh, specialists who can accommodate their needs. Is it, what, what kind of skills will be needed in the future? What at, at what level are we talking about, and is is this country um, investing enough in it, and is are the Chinese doing a good job? Which country is doing, the, the which country can actually act as a model, or is, is it just really trying to compare, you know, the, the least, uh, the, the, the best of the lot, or can, what can we do to be better? Well, you know, I think the, the U.S. kind of got a wake-up call recently when they saw this uh, new national strategy in China and, and kind of um, assessed what happened in the last decade. So you have, for example, in China, you have campuses, uh, genomic sequencing campuses, where students stay 
<laughs> they live on the campus. They don't. They don't. You know. They don't <laughs> go back home, or they have relationship on the campus. It's 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 your home that you sequence genomes, mm -hmm. twenty four hours on twenty four seven. So I mean, it's a very very That's intensive. Strange. So there is a, a you know a harnessing of the of the human capital there. There there is a lot of investment in the education, in forming, in becoming the next AI superpower, mm -hmm. and that goes from education to investing in the private sector to guiding the private sector with. Uh, indeed, the uh, the party, you know, looking at what direction the strategy is taking. The U.S. is a more um, almost a more bottom-up, spontaneous kind of ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, was saying maybe we should actually capitalize on on our strength because that's what we are good at. We mm -hmm. are very inventive, creative, with this kind of more spontaneous way of uh, of creating AI innovation. Um, that that still means you know we need investment. Right. Uh, absol you absolutely need investment. Um, I think the reason why we don't have a national AI strategy under this administration is because the administration is kind of negotiating the relationship with the private sector on this and, and, and how there, there could be a permeability between civil and, mili and military uses, mm -hmm. civil and, mili and military research. All of that is kind of being negotiated. And the fact that you don't have a strategy means you can be a little more permissionless. So it kind of gives you know some, some freedom, some air, but uh, we are gonna lose in the long run if there are more, not more investment. And especially as you were saying, in human capital. What happened in the last decade is that uh, the US um, progressively saw acquisition of their human capital and their technology by China. You, saw, you see that in AI and in the genomics field. And you see collaboration between very, very high level uh, laboratories uh, in AI and genomics in the US going to China mm. to work in close collaboration uh, even, you know, starting some of their most inventive uh, research venture. So the outside of uh, what the government wants to, con you know, direct or conduct, you have collaboration, you have data flows. Um, we actually, the amount of data exfiltrated to China is just enormous from the US. Right. And, and it's uh, personal data that we, you know, we use in our economy, but also genomics data. Right. So that has been happening for a while now. And uh, there is definitely a wake-up call trying to figure out, you know, how we stop some of those tech acquisition or how do we govern and, and regulate that mm -hmm. and how do we grow our own uh, human capital uh, in, in the U.S. Right, okay. Um, I did see a hand over there. Um, if we could wait for the microphone. Hi, um, this is a question regarding uh, the timeline that you talked about. Um, you mentioned that the U.S. is a world leader right now in AI, and within 10 years, the balance of power will shift. Um, do you really think that it will take 10 years because uh, Chinese users are willing to trade their personal and privacy data, and they have been for convenience, um, but do you honestly think it will only take 10 years mm -hmm. and it won't happen within five, six? Uh, time I is a commodity. So I wouldn't I think say. I, I didn't say ten years. Yeah, I wouldn't say. You know, we we cannot necessarily put a number of years on that. Uh, w you know wh what um, um, what experts are using as a parameter right now is that uh, China just um, started to publish more than the U.S. in terms of AI publication. But if you really look at that, those numbers, and if you look at self citations and everything, were. It's it's not really necessarily uh, you know a criteria we should take into account as um, significantly as it has been uh, cited, but definitely you know it's a wake up call. I mean the the national strategy in China is uh, is pretty strong, so I wouldn't say ten years. I don't think I don't think we know. You still have you know most of the very leading startups and and um, uh, latest, latest development in deep learning and and more than that deep learning that would be closer to biological intelligence, all of that is, is happening in the US. I mean, DARPA and ARPA are leading very, ex very, very interesting research projects, but we are getting to a much closer um, tide here, and so investment would be actually really, really key, and, and probably a, struc you know, a structuring of those investments with, uh, for with more foresight. I would just add two things. I think China is farther behind than a lot, you know, you hear a lot about this patent thing, and the Chinese just, their patent system is so weak that, you know, you, 
they, they patent this and they get three patents for it and it's not very good patents. And so you can't look at just those numbers. If you look at what the big major tech companies in China, IT companies in China are investing in AI, it, it is not anywhere near what the U.S. leaders are investing in. So it's, it's, it's much, much lower. If you look at the top 20 R&D firms in the world, I believe seven of them are U.S. technology companies. Combined, they fund, they spend more than nine times what the National Science Foundation spends in toto. So we've got a, we've got an advantage, we've got a lead, um, and um, you know, if China keeps doing what it's doing, eventually, I think it'll, it, it, it could overtake us. Um, but we still have a lead, uh, which is important to remember. And the second thing is, it's, it's, it's important to remember. Uh, data has a diminishing marginal returns. You know, it's, it's w once you get up to a certain level, you can do really, really well. Adding another hundred million data points doesn't get you that much. So I think people are overstating China's advantage. They have a billion people. Well, you know, we have 350 million people, and for a lot of things, that's more than adequate to do. So uh, it doesn't. You know, they're not three times. They're not what three times, three point five times better than us because uh, they have three point five times more people than we do. Um, again, though, I think, I think it goes back to, I think we're at risk of shooting ourselves in the foot. I think, I think if the Democrats, and I'm not saying this in a partisan way, but if the Democrats win the Congress, the odds of a GDPR rule go way, way up. Uh, we just issued a report two weeks ago showing how the GDPR is going to be extremely detrimental to European AI ability. It would be detrimental if we did that here. We also seem to have this new uh, anti-monopoly uh, uh, crusade that somehow are advocating or you know that we have to break up big tech I guarantee you if you do that we will have the Chinese will catch up much much more quickly so we should build on the advantages we have we're not able or willing to put money into this mm -hmm. but at least let's not screw up the core advantages that the US system provides Okay, all right um, this is gonna be our last question Hi, uh, Raison Wilson Center. Um, I have a question about fake news, specifically fake health news. Um, so in China, um, there, there's been a lot of issues where search algorithms and like popular search engines have in ba Baidu have popularized like hoaxes. WeChat has also been a, a problem in so sort of circulating like fake medicines. Um, so my question is, how, as um, me like medicine becomes more sort of data driven, um, like and even other online services become data driven, how do they? How do regulators and firms sort of account for misinformation that sort of gets into uh, the systems? Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. I mean, we're kind of uh, uh, experimenting as we go, but I, I, I would say what's the most uh, important or significant at this point is the quality of your data set. So I focus more on genomics, precision medicine than you know, some of the other health sectors, but you need very high level uh, quality data sets. And if you have that, um, our brain computation is not able to actually decode all the different regulatory systems between of our different genes. You need a much more um, efficient uh, form of, com of computation, and that's what AI um, provides. What I see when I meet with um, experts you know, in those laboratories is that they still need to train the algorithms in very specific ways. They need to do a lot of risk assessment to be sure they are not catching false, false positives when they do uh, genomics analysis. So it's a, it's a difficult business, right? It's just really still at the research level, um, a difficult enterprise. You have, so in the precision medicine, um, I would say legitimate sector, you have very interesting research happening, still in progress difficult to, to achieve. Then you have somehow also a pseudoscience kind of a, you know, a movement around health, which is linked to ho how much you could know just by um, you know, analyzing a few snippets of your DNA, like, uh, yeah, like consumer-driven genetic testing, and you know, trying to kind of um, imply and, and, and uh, demystify a lot of uh, phenotype, phenotypic threats just based on a few DNA snippets. I mean, all of that is kind of pseudoscience. It has a market, though, because, you know, for I, I mean, in China, there are a few uh, services of that sort that are um, telling you, you know, if your child is going to be good at mathematics, be good at STEM. I mean, it's, it's just pseudoscience, but mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a market for this that goes, you know, with the 
kind of false expectations of the data-driven economy. Um, how do we do with that misinformation? That's a very good question. It's it's kind of part of you know this governance we're still trying to think about, but it has to be an adaptive governance. So many questions. Um, I know we can continue this conversation, um, but our time has come, and I'm very sorry again that we uh, have had problems on on technology <laughs> in our front. Um, but if you could uh, join me in thanking our panelists, Sam, Rob, and Eleanor, and I also want to thank you for coming, but above all else, I do want to thank FPRI for giving the Wilson Center this opportunity to host this discussion, and I hope you'll join us again in, in sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Senior Associate for Northeast Asia here at the Wilson Center um, with the Asia Program. Um, I want to um, express my gratitude to the Foreign Policy Research Institute with whom we have partnered yet again to make this event possible. And we're very honored to be able to work with FPRI based in Philadelphia. Um, I also want to thank um, within the Wilson Center the Kissinger Institute uh, which has worked closely with us to bring this event and what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about a very ambitious topic, East Asia's economic future. Um, it is obviously a, a subject that can be uh, sliced and diced in many ways, but we really want to do it in two parts. The first part we will be talking about what has brought us here. We look at the um, tensions regarding trade relations. We look at the um, um, rise of economic nationalism. But on the other hand, we've also seen a rise of a desire for further uh, global cooperation. We've seen the rise of ambitious trade agreements, most notably the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which continues to uh, flourish um, in spite of the uh, US pullout. So the first panel, which will be led by Jacques de Lille um, from the University of Pennsylvania, um, who is also um, a key member of FPRI's um, team leading its Asia activities, will be moderating that discussion. <coughs> we'll have a brief intermission after that. And the second panel uh, will focus from where do we go from there on out? What are some of the policies um, that can actually help us to address not only the issues of why we are seeing so much uh, frustration about globalization, but also about policies that could be um, taken in order to enhance competitiveness in the 21st century. Um, before I uh, hand over to the first panel, I do also want to thank, in addition to Jacques, um, Eli, as well as Tatiana, from FPRI, as well as my colleagues Joshua Spooner and uh, Mary Ratliff, um, who have worked very hard to be able to bring this event to you. So with that, um, I would like to invite our first uh, panel speaker onto the stage. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be back here at the Woodrow Wilson Center and to continue our uh, now long-standing and, and fruitful uh, collaboration with Shahoko's program, uh, the Asia program here at the Wilson Center. Uh, we at FPRI are, are delighted to have the latest installment on that. Uh, the next to latest installment was actually yesterday up in Philadelphia uh, where we held a session on the same topics with slightly overlapping uh, personnel. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how the alignment uh, plays out with a slightly different cast of characters. I'm just to say a couple words of, of background here and then introduce our panelists. Uh, well, the TPP, uh, you know, is, is a, a recurrent subject of discussion, indeed, has been the subject of presidential tweets and comments even within the last uh, week or so, uh, perhaps not the most dramatic of presidential tweets, but one that suggested uh, a perhaps a reconsideration of, of uh, the U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis the TPP after the withdrawal that uh, President Trump announced on his uh, first working day uh, in office. Now, there's a, a rich uh, background here, of course, which I think probably everyone in this uh, room knows, and I think we'll be uh, talking about and hearing from different views on, on what the TPP would have meant and what it does mean uh, now that the U.S. is not in it. Uh, the deep background, of course, here is 
uh, the broad project associated with trade liberalization and economic integration uh, that for many years was centered on the WTO. With the uh, collapse or petering out of the Doha round, uh, we turn to mega regional uh, trade agreements and, and very much trade plus agreements getting into a, a range of issues, including investment more deeply uh, than the WTO center regime did, uh, harmonization of regulation, telecommunications, e-commerce, uh, state-owned enterprise regulations, intellectual property protection, environment, labor uh, issues, some of which had made it in the WTO process and some of which were uh, were um, of reach beyond that as, as agreements like the TPP came onto the table. Uh, the TPP-12, uh, with the U.S. included, would have been more than a third of uh, global GDP, 40 percent or so, uh, much smaller, obviously, with the U.S. out. Uh, and there was, of course, a yeasty debate about how significant the TPP was, how radically liberalizing it would be, uh, and how much of its economic impact, um, how, how big an economic impact it would have. Uh, even the biggest numbers on direct economic impact were quite small, about half a percent of U.S. Uh, GDP uh, growth, but uh, much of the advocacy for it was uh, not simply on the possible impact directly, but on the indirect impact on uh, setting up rules for the next uh, number of decades in the in the uh, trading regime and perhaps expanding also to include other member economies, uh, including South Korea, which got promoted into it accidentally, I think, by a presidential tweet, uh, as well as uh, possibly China, uh, Taiwan, and others uh, down uh, the path. Uh, so that's kind of where we were. Uh, and then, of course, the, the U.S. opted out, and, and despite the recent flirtation with opting back in, uh, we face a moment where it's a question of figuring out what the TPP means now that it's the CPTPP, uh, which is the, uh, the 11, not counting the U.S., with Japan assuming a much a larger role, and uh, whether this is a good thing, a bad thing, or how we will cope with it. And we've got uh, an excellent panel set up to discuss that. Uh, and I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll sort of under, I, I think actually having looked at this, I'm going to scramble the order a little bit, if that's okay, uh, in, in terms of, of what I think will, um, will make for a bit of, uh, a bit more sort of uh, order of presentation that will be coherent and useful for our discussion. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Derek Scissors who is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on the Chinese and Indian economies and on U.S. economic relations with Asia. He's the chief economist of the China Beige Book and the author of the China Global Investment Tracker. Uh, he has uh, been, shall we say, somewhat uh, critical or skeptical of China's economic reforms, uh, uh, being one of the early people to, to focus on uh, the uh, petering out or, or, or stagnation that comes with, uh, with the turn against reform a bit, which he dates back to around 2008. He was also a senior research fellow in the Asian Economics, uh, uh, the Asian Studies Center at the Heritage Foundation and adjunct professor of economics at GW, uh, and was an officer in international economics and energy for uh, the Department of Defense. And then I think we'll uh, go to Ina Manak, who's immediately to my left here. She's a visiting scholar at the Cato Institute here in Washington and is uh, in the Department of Government at Georgetown University. And her research focuses on escalation of early stage trade conflicts and the role of private actors at WTO, obviously germane to our discussion uh, here in a variety of ways. And finally, uh, Bruce Hirsch, who is the principal and founder of Tailwind Global Strategies, LLC, and he has uh, many decades of experience developing and implementing solutions to complex global problems, uh, 18 years in leadership positions in the executive branch in Congress. Uh, he's you know, really somebody who's deeply versed in about everything we're going to talk about here uh, with, uh, with stints in, in, a, in a huge number of, of uh, government um, uh, undertakings in this space. I would go on, but you've got half a page here <laughs> on your bio thing. Uh, and so rather than deprive Bruce of a chance to talk about these topics, I will simply say that um, uh, there is just really too much uh, to go into here, but, but, but on, on APEC, U.S. Korea free, free Trade Agreement, WTO, the whole, whole range of things. So I will stop there and turn it over to Derek. Uh, thanks. Um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me and an interesting choice to put me first. I guess that's to get all the cynicism and uh, accusations out of the way <laughs> right away <laughs> and let the other panelists respond. Uh, I'm going to try really hard to stick to 10 minutes because I'd rather have a discussion. I already know what I'm going to say, uh, and I'm a little bored with it. Um, I don't think there's any possibility, real possibility. I mean, I think the possibility of real global or regional trade progress is about 10 to 20 percent. Of course, and like so 80, 90 percent of something else, including regression. Of course, we can have a lot of diplomatic posturing. That's like what East Asia loves in trade agreements is that they're fake trade agreements and they're entirely diplomatic. Um, we can get, we can have that, but real progress I don't think we're going to have, and I'll try to walk you through that with you know a lot of cynicism. 
Uh, I don't think most of the region is interested in open trade. New Zealand is for obvious reasons. Australia somewhat, Singapore somewhat, uh, except for SOEs, Korea except for currency. Um, the record of the bulk of the region is that it wants open markets if only they can get at better access to bigger markets elsewhere. Right? That's it's not it's not doesn't believe in in, in open trade as as better for the, for an economy unless it's conditional on we can export more than we have to import. And even then they have to be dragged to that outcome, complaining all the way uh, about their development status or particular sectors or so on. Um, so what the region is worried now is not about, oh my goodness, the institutions of global trade are fading, it's access to the American market. And talk from these countries ab about principles, I don't find it all convincing. I've been listening to them for a long time and their principles go away as soon as they have to make a sacrifice on their side. Um, my institutional skepticism is actually worse uh, than that. Um, you know, the WTO has not made any substantial progress in you know, a generation. We negotiated over it, we just didn't actually make it. Um, we could retain the existing rules, which are wildly outdated in many respects, and dispute settlement. Uh, I'll be frank, you know, not only does the U.S. want new rules, clearly, um, it's I, I, a major WTO decision against the United States, this administration will just ignore. It won't demand, a, you know, that the WTO collapse or, would, or withdraw. It just won't pay attention. Um, when you haven't updated your trade rules in 25 years, which is basically the situation of the WTO, you're a dying body. Uh, RCEP, um, protection of trade status quo, diplomatic exercise, there's no additional liberalization of any consequence. It's not done, so how can I be confident? I use this line all the time. I'm confident that RCEP will not result in meaningful additional trade liberalization because India is an RCEP. So think about that for a second. Uh, TPP 11, I don't see any measurable impact on existing trade patterns. Um, there was a natural weakening of the agreement uh, with U.S. withdrawal, such as in IP. Um, if, you in, if you thought the U.S. was actually interested in, in uh, rejoining, then TPP-11 would matter. I don't see a U.S. rejoin of TPP being on the table till 2023 at the earliest, so um, you know, that's, how, that's when TPP-11 might matter. Uh, the original TPP, I thought the rules were decent, except for competitive ne the competitive neutrality chapter, which was atrociously weak. But there were so many exceptions, especially in services. Um, you know, I, I did this back of the envelope calculation when the, when the, the text of the agreement first came out, and I just could not find an increase in U.S. services exports of any magnitude. And the U.S. is the most comprehensively competitive services exporter in the world. Why are we signing a free trade agreement if we're not getting a services export increase? Um, so, I, you know, it was a step toward a good, t good FTA, not a good FTA in itself. And I don't, I didn't even then see any path that we were going to make it a better FTA. There are all these people saying, well, we won't let the Chinese join unless they have different rules. But that was not going to happen. It was a pipe dream. So I'm both skeptical of the participants and skeptical of the institutions. Um, that's background. I, I think I'm here because I know something about administration policy, such that anyone can know anything about it. Um, <coughs> we are not, uh, just the framework, the United States is not bound to keep the status quo. I keep getting these screaming matches with friends of mine in Australia where they're just insistent that the U.S. is never allowed to change its mind about trade. That's just not true. We're allowed to change our minds. We're allowed to say we don't want the same trade framework that we had five years ago or 25 years ago or whatever it happens to be. Um, moreover, I completely agree with the, the idea of the administration's attack on Chinese I IP practice and industrial policy, and I think it's long overdue. I would have started with an attack on regulatory protection for standard enterprises, but that's more harder and more complicated, so I think they're trying in, in, at the most basic level to do the right thing. Um, the president's tweets makes, makes U.S. policy seem facile. It's certainly not a, f a, a, a superficial shift um, in larger U.S. political terms. Um, we saw Ted Cruz flip on uh, TPA. He signed an a op-ed with Paul Ryan in, in favor of it, and then he went against it. We saw Hillary Clinton flip on TPP, and some people said she would have flipped back, wouldn't have made any difference. Um, we saw Bernie Sanders, as, who's a sort of traditional Democratic protectionist, um, the top four finishers in the last U.S. presidential nomination were all notably more protectionist than existing U.S. policy or than recent U.S. major political figures, not just Trump. Um, Trump wins, and I'm not a U.S. political expert, possibly the margin provided by industrial workers who are angry about trade. That's certainly a, an interpretation that's common within the political parties. Um, we tend to overinterpret the last election, but that means that they're gonna be, it's going to be very difficult to pivot hard to, to the free trade side, given what are perceived as the results of the election. 
And just the economic side of the U.S. shift, um, everyone knows this. People in, in my former employer uh, like calling Barack Obama a socialist, but under President Obama, there was a $36 trillion increase in, in household wealth, which is more than the household wealth of any other country in total. Um, we didn't have a problem with wealth creation, even though he was a socialist. Um, people were angry because lo labor force productivity fell three points over time uh, during the administration to this lowest point in 40 years. And 75% of wealth is held by the top 10% of households. So they're not angry about growth and they're not angry about consumer purchasing power. They're angry about inequality and participation. Well, in response to problems with inequality and participation, protectionism makes a lot more sense than it does when you're upset about growth and purchasing power. We don't have a growth and purchasing power problem. So free trade is not going to add that much more because we're already doing well on that basis. Now we may give up some of that, but the acute problems in the American economy, protectionism makes more sense as an economic strategy. Now, I, this is very unconventional thinking because free trade is always better than protectionism. <laughs> you know, not if your main issue is workers who have been priced out of, out of the labor market in the U.S. by imports. And that's arguably the main problem in the United States right now. Uh, if the main problem was innovation, then free trade would be better. If the main problem was growth, then free trade would be better. But I don't think it is growth or innovation. So briefly on the next steps, because that's the other panel. Um, the administration has failed to telegraph its policy. Uh, you know, it doesn't tell you where it's going. It doesn't tell you why. Um, and this, this harms our trade partners, and it's unnecessary harm. And I wish we would announce a strategy. I think we're allowed to change our minds. I think we're allowed to tell our trade partners, sorry, we're not doing what you want anymore. But we should tell them. Um, we're trying to use uncertainty as a weapon in negotiations, and, and it hurts good American partners, and, and uh, we need a, a clearer policy. But we are at least doing the right thing without talking about it very clearly. NAFTA it should be and is the top U.S. trade priority. Um, finishing a NAFTA agreement, you know, President Trump can sign an agreement with Mexico that both will, will sign on to. That opens the door to a lot of, of trade negotiations if we're interested. It enhances U.S. credibility as well as the the substantive economic side for North America. Um, so that is our number one priority. It should be our number one priority. A lot of sins of lack of, of clear, clear strategy from the Trump administration would be forgiven if they can finish NAFTA this year. The limit in this case, to my mind, is congressional Democrats more than anything else. They, very few of them uh, supported Obama's uh, TPA proposal, Trade Promotion Authority proposal. Um, they're never gonna vote for a Trump trade or whatever ridiculous label these things are going to get. Um, so if the Democrats take the House, as is likely in 2018, that's two years where you're not getting anything through on trade. Um, doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter how much you like it, it's not gonna pass. Um, if the US fails with NAFTA, which I really hope we don't, um, you're gonna see increasing market, increasing US pressure on a lot of economies in East Asia, and they're gonna have a narrowing set of options because the US is gonna be making shifting and possibly unpalatable demands and picking out winners and losers among its trade partners. Not a policy I uh, uh, support, but I can't give you any more guidance on that because we're not getting any more guidance out of the administration right now. So there is a little, I'm done, there's a little bit of hope here, but the hope is we get NAFTA finished. And then we have terms that the administration accepted and we can push them more easily on who else will you sign a deal with other than the Canadians and the Mexicans. If we don't get NAFTA finished, I think East Asia is gonna get s progressively squeezed over the next four years. Uh, next three years, and the politics of this, of the U.S. right now, and the economics suggest that the squeeze will last beyond President Trump's first term. Thank you. Yes, thank you to the organizers for putting this all together. Um, my remarks are going to focus on the Trump administration's uh, negotiating tactics, uh, particularly with the recent uh, chorus negotiations that just concluded, and explain how this might impact future trade negotiations in the region and elsewhere in the world. Um, the administration has been consistently vocal uh, in its support for bilateral trade deals. Uh, this has come again and again in, in, in through various officials. Uh, and it set its sights on either updating old agreements, uh, such as NAFTA and CORUS, or in terms of creating new ones. We don't really know what those new ones might be yet, uh, but we'll find out hopefully sometime soon. So how these negotiations are handled uh, will be a good indication of the administration's overall trade priorities and also how other countries might respond. So it's important to pay attention to how these unfold. 
Now, I think the administration's general approach uh, to trade policy is based on two key premises. The first being that the U.S. is being taken advantage of by other countries, and the second being that since others can't be trusted, uh, multilateral institutions in particular uh, are a threat, and so we're not going to work within those rules or within these institutions. So this worldview has led to a heightened preference for bilateral trade deals, which administration argues it has more leverage in, going one-on-one -on -one against countries instead of with many. Uh, in addition, in order to level the playing field or to increase fairness, the administration has tabled a number of controversial policies uh, that often seem to be non-starters. So in the context of NAFTA, uh, which they also wanted to do as two bilaterals originally, they put forward a proposal to have 50 percent U.S. content requirement in the value-added calculation of autos in North America. Now, industry knows this is impossible uh, and didn't want to really talk about it, but it was thrown in there as a starting point, and it's quite a big ask at the beginning of a negotiation. So specifically, if you look at uh, things that have been asked and how these negotiations have con been conducted, the focus of the administration's demands uh, seems to be on reducing the trade deficit or appearing to reduce the trade deficit through the negotiations, uh, and also in boosting the U.S. industrial base. And Chorus follows this uh, really well. So the Washington Post recently reported uh, that senior administration officials have been touting uh, the Chorus Agreement as visionary and innovative, uh, saying that it underscores a pattern of failure by previous administrations to negotiate fair and reciprocal deals. Some officials have also touted the currency side deal that was part of the Chorus uh, as historic. Well, I say we should evaluate what this is, and, and we don't know exactly what's in it yet because we didn't see in the full text, but we know from USTR press releases and other comments from senior officials what will be in the new course. I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that. I think Chorus had two sets of key outcomes that you can categorize, and I'll focus on a few of them. Uh, one was new issues and side deals, uh, and the second were modifications and amendments to the existing agreement. So in terms of new issues, I would say the most prominent one that sticks out to me that tells us a little bit about the Trump administration's trade policy uh, were the steel quotas. So Korea agreed to limit steel exports uh, to 70 percent of the last three-year average um, of their exports to the United States. This was in exchange for a permanent exemption to the 232 tariffs on steel the administration put into effect. So. You know, the Korean producers might not be too concerned about this because U.S. prices, their prices are going to increase, and so they're going to get more money from this. Um, what will be hurt will be uh, U.S. steel consuming industries. But I would say the more troubling development that I see uh, has been not only bringing trade policy back to the 1980s, but also just ig ignoring all WTO rules on this. Uh, voluntary export restraints have not been used openly like this uh, since the WTO was established, and I think this is a troubling trend. Um, in terms of modifications and amendments to the chorus, uh, things that I would point out that were interesting uh, of note were uh, the autos rules and the trucks rules. Um, so on autos, under the previous chorus, uh, U.S. manufacturers are allowed to export to Korea uh, 25,000 units, so 25,000 vehicles, um, by each manufacturer. This quota was increased to 50,000 per manufacturer. Now you'd look at this and say, hey, pretty good. This is like net liberalizing, and I think it's good to further open up the Korean market. Um, but when you look at the economics of it, it's questionable whether this actually is going to do anything for U.S. auto manufacturers. So U.S. passenger and light truck uh, exports to Korea in 2017, in total, were about 52,000 vehicle units. So when you're talking about a quota of 50,000 per manufacturer and you only have 52,000 total being sent to Korea, this is not, we're not meeting our quota even close to it to begin with. Ford and General Motors uh, exported about 10,000 units each or less than 10,000 units each. Um, and so this idea that increasing the quota will change exports, I think it's a bit of a stretch. And with regard to light trucks, the administration took a far more protectionist tack. Uh, we had a 25% tariff that's supposed to be in place till 2021. That's now been extended to 2041. Uh, and Korea currently does not export any light trucks to the United States, but this is precisely because there's a tariff on it of 25%. And in fact, Ambassador Lighthizer said as much, and I'll quote you uh, in an interview that he gave in CNBC that says, the Koreans don't ship trucks to the United States right now, and the reason they don't is because of the tariff. He said, they were going to start next year. We would have seen massive truck shipments, uh, so that's put off for two decades. 
So it's not really hiding uh, sort of the, the goal here, which is really to support um, U.S. light truck manufacturers, and there won't be a Korean truck in Korea until earliest 2041 because of this policy. Now, there were many other amendments and changes, and I can talk about them later, um, but they weren't really prominently featured uh, in uh, Lighthizer's comments, um, and it's not really clear what the importance of these other provisions that were highlighted in the course negotiations were. But looking ahead and seeing what has happened through these negotiations, what can we glean from the administration's overall policy and then what can we do about it uh, going forward? Um, so I'm probably a little bit more optimistic than Derek is, um, but you can- Everyone else is too. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Um, but I know, for me, I think that Chorus really shows us the administration wants to make symbolic wins, really big symbolic wins. This is not to say they don't want real change, um, but the focus is really important. The marketing of it is important. So it's no to unfairness, no to outsourcing. You look at the negotiations and they focus on uh, pro-export issues, focusing on manufacturing in particular. So other negotiating party partners should be paying attention to this and recognizing in advance what's probably going to be brought to the table in a negotiation. I think withdrawal threats, to a large extent, are a negotiating tactic. They're an effective one, it seems to be, um, but they've been used just for that. And I, I don't think they should be taken incredibly seriously because if we look at the impact of these agreements, for example, Chorus, 58% increase of imports happen in the Rust Belt states alone from Chorus. So I think you know th they, they need to understand, and I think the Trump administration does understand uh, the impact of withdrawal and how it would have on their main constituents on their base. I mean, Korean companies through investments have created over 75,000 jobs in the United States states alone after chorus was put into effect. But again, I do offer a word of caution that this might depend on context. So, you know, NAFTA, which is the worst deal ever negotiated, um, according mm -hmm. to Trump, I don't know if chorus is like the third worst because TPP has to be second or something. <laughs> um, you know, maybe the asks are going to be higher for NAFTA. So Korea might have gotten away with something a lot lighter than what could have happened um, had it been far more important in their priority list. So with NAFTA, we're having really big asks, like on government procurement, eliminating ISDS, uh, and, and it's just they're really pushing hard on that. So I think Korea in many ways dodged a bullet here, and this was a lot easier to negotiate. The second point I'll make uh, that we need to focus on um, in terms of taking away from the chorus was that the administration is really willing to work outside of international rules and outside of the trading system. So the inclusion of the voluntary export restraint as part of the side agreement in these negotiations is a troubling trend. Um, overly relying on national security as a justification for these sorts of measures I think is, is very concerning. But then we have to think, where will this end? Are they going to ask for these sorts of side agreements in future uh, trade agreements that they're going to negotiate? And will it stop with just steel? Or is this going to go beyond steel as well? And the last point I'll say, and maybe the only hopeful point I think I have of all of this, is that the administration wants to conclude quick deals. This is a good thing because if you're doing them quick, uh, you can't do a massive overhaul of the entire architecture. So I don't think they're trying to toss everything out the window, um, but looking for ways to, to get the main goals accomplished. And so that really has to do with uh, boosting the industrial base uh, and trying to find ways to improve U.S. exports. Now, the problem is, is that you, know, you really can't use trade agreements to do a lot of these things like reducing a trade deficit, which is probably why they're not overhauling trade agreements. Um, but at the same time, uh, there is this aversion to working within the rules and why multilateral deals are sort of a no-go. Um, I don't think we'll have a, you know, maybe another round at the WTO, perhaps, uh, or TTIP, because um, it's a mega-regional. And I don't think the Europeans will be willing to be bullied um, as the Koreans were. And I think the strategy is a little different there. And in terms of TPP, what we learned from Chorus is, yeah, there's probably not going to be a TPP anytime soon, uh, if ever. Uh, and the recently muddled statements by various administration officials have shown that, that they're not even clear as to what they want to do on this. So the bottom line, at the end of the day, is the rest of the world should not look to the United States for leadership in international trade right now, um, and, but should continue to try and preserve as many of the rules as they can and work within them in challenging the U.S. when it veers outside of those rules. Well, thanks. Uh, so now we've heard a somewhat um, pessimistic to critical set of views on, uh, mm -hmm. on projects that Bruce, you've been deeply involved in. So you've seen it from the executive <laughs> side as assistant USTR it's for, all Bruce's fault. For, for the region <laughs> and, and <laughs> negotiating trade facilitation and all that sort of thing. And you've also seen it from the uh, legislative side, working for 
uh, the Senate uh, Finance Committee on uh, as, as the um, uh, chief, ca chief Trade Counsel. So you've seen it from both branches at an earlier phase when I think it's fair to say there was a lot more optimism about the WTO. So uh, do you join the parade of pessimism or are you going to tell us how to get out of this fix? <laughs> well, um, I, I join the parade of pessimism in, 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 in the sense that um, uh, the direction that we're headed is, is a pessimistic one, but not necessarily with regard to where we've come from or what the alternative was. Um, I'll, I'll largely toss out what I was planning on, on addressing and, and, and really just start the conversation now. Um, you know, with regard to TPP, and you know that that's where we started the discussion, and and and, and the issue was well, it's being kept alive now through the CPTPP, and what does that mean? Um, it, it was meaningful, and perhaps um, not as meaningful as a uh, a major uh, WTO round in, in terms of market access, but you know it was meaningful. I think in, in large part because of the rules that it was establishing. And I, I think for the United States and for others like Japan in particular, this was the real um, emphasis of the uh, agreement is that there were rules that were higher standard than any other FTA that had been. They may not have gone as far as uh, we would have liked, but the fact is they were establishing a higher baseline uh, for how business is being done, how or trade is being regulated than had existed to that point in, in the region. Um, totally agree with the analysis of RCEP and that you know some of these agreements are very, very low standard, but TPP was specifically designed to counter that and to provide an alternative to that. And through the economic weight of uh, the parties that were involved to uh, force or uh, simply at attract others uh, to want to uh, start to make reforms to meet those standards against the day when they would be able to, to join TPP. So uh, I guess I, that's where I would differ in my evaluation. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that the TPP is still going to live on, I think, is, is significant, uh, both because it does, uh, again, establish that, that baseline of, of, of high standard rules, uh, and also because it, it does provide an opportunity at some point. Um, uh, again, I wouldn't necessarily disagree on how soon that might be, but it does provide an opportunity to, uh, for the U.S. to, to re-engage and to uh, become part of that region. Um, you know, with regard to uh, the, the, you know, the take on, on how serious uh, those in the region might be about the, you know, trade liberalization and, and the principles that have, have underlied the training system. Um, you know, look, any trade negotiation, uh, even among the most principled, let's say, um, you know, involves a lot of looking at uh, national interests and uh, stakeholder interests. So, you know, it's no surprise that that is a key part of any negotiation. Um, but I think that, um, you know, with regard to, uh, you know, the parties in the region, I think they, like many in the world, took for granted that there would be certain underlying rules uh, that would be governing uh, trade. And in the face of uh, um, administration policies which uh, pay less heed to those rules, I think you, you, you expose a certain baseline level again, of, of concern and support for those rules that really there was no need to uh, advocate for, really to uh, express a view on because of the fact that they were so taken for granted for so long. Um, I, I think that that as well is a dynamic which you are going to see and which you do have we've already seen in terms of the political dynamic here in the United States. Um, you know, it's absolutely the case that in the context of the 2016 campaign, um, we were treated to um, a, a rather unique uh, view uh, on trade that we had not seen in previous elections. Um, but now, with, again, an administration that is breaking the mold in terms of the approaches that it's taking, uh, we're seeing uh, that, uh, I'm not sure if we'd call them the silent majority, <laughs> uh, but, you know, certainly we're seeing um, pushback in response to some of these new and uh, novel policies, which are revealing a certain baseline support for traditional trade approaches and policies that had been silent during the campaign in 2016 and which uh, now in the face of, of actual um, uh, risks uh, are, are being exposed. So you see, you saw the strong pushback uh, from the uh, NAFTA um, 
in the context of the threats to withdraw from NAFTA and Korea, with the ag community and others uh, coming in uh, very strongly and saying this is a bridge too far. You even had in the context of early discussions about the WTO and withdrawing, uh, the, even uh, the unions coming in and saying, well, well hold on here. We're, we're saying that things are, certain things need to be changed, but we're not saying that we don't need rules. And uh, so I, I think that what we're, we're, we're seeing now in the context of uh, the Trump administration's uh, uh, really, uh, you, know, uh, you know, as Derek put it, you know, use of uncertainty um, and, and unpredictability as a, as a trade weapon, you know, we're, we're seeing folks who are forced to come forward and, and say, well, this is, our, our ox will be gored if some of the more traditional trade approaches aren't, aren't followed. Um, on that on that point, uh, you know, again, it's 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 a challenge for all of us to keep track of of what the the next uh, step might or might not be. Um, but that uh, the only the only principle that we really have seen so far is this desire to gain leverage, uh, and, and gain leverage in part through unpredictability and uncertainty, um, whether it's by withdrawing, uh, threatening to withdraw from agreements or by uh, creating threatened duties in the context of the Section 301 uh, or uh, in the uh, 232 where the duties have certainly been put on in place and are, are now being used as attempts uh, to gain leverage in uh, bilateral discussions. And of course, that, that makes it very difficult for anybody to plan, um, in particular um, uh, our trading partners in, in terms of how to deal uh, with um, the administration and, and where it might be going. Um, you know, so everybody's looking for signals on, on what that might be. Um, in the context of chorus, I, I agree with, with Ina that this was they perhaps uh, uh, was, was a bit more of a moderate outcome than many were expecting, um, that uh, you know, it was a lower profile uh, um, uh, issue than, say, for example, NAFTA, and that NAFTA really will be a lot more revealing, um, in, not just because of its scale and its visibility, but also because uh, of the, the nature of some of the proposals that have been put on the table in the context of NAFTA. These are proposals which really do uh, break the mold of, of a traditional trade agreement, whether it's some sort of sunset clause or non-binding dispute settlement um, or, or some of the others. And so I, I think everybody is really going to be looking for signals as to where that lands uh, as to uh, the direction that uh, the next stage of asks might be in agreements that are coming down the pike. Uh, I'll stop there. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you. We're going to throw it open to the audience in a moment, but I wanted to, to uh, toss one thing to the panel, probably starting with, with Bruce, and then if others want to weigh in. Um, uh, Derek identified China as sort of job two <laughs> on this, right? Um, given the approach that you've just described, what are the prospects for the U.S. getting any leverage on that front, and has the uh, Trump administration's methods uh, made that harder, uh, less likely to succeed? Um, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go, go. Okay. I'll follow. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I... I you know, in, in this context, you know, a bit of uncertainty and pr unpredictability uh, may actually have had had some benefits. Um, you know, I, you know, I, you know they, they, the administration has established its 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 uh, credibility for willing its willingness to go forward with some of these ideas and tariffs and in the context of the 232. So that that certainly is going to make the, the 301 uh, threat more credible. Um, you know, Derek will have a better sense of of of, of how China might react, but in that sense, you know, sure that this this might be might be helpful. Um, where it might not be helpful and has not been helpful is in the context of of keeping uh, or building alliances that might uh, actually be very critical to to changing policies because you know the China China does not want to be isolated, and um, in that regard, uh, you know, it was very untimely to as we were trying to convince our allies to join us uh, against you know in, in these matters against China to have slapped two thirty two. Uh, duties against them. Um, and right now, uh, while the United States has pursued a, a dual track, w um, in part going to the WTO for certain issues and in part unilateral uh, threat of tariffs uh, and investment restrictions, uh, it's notable that for all that Japan and the EU were really pressing the United States to go to the WTO, uh, they've not joined the case uh, as co-complainants. And I think you have to assume that you know, the, the Section 232 tariffs had a lot to do with that. So, um, you know, yes, there's a prospect now of, of using some of this new leverage uh, to gain uh, some uh, positive results with China. 
um, you know, it's hard to see China giving on a lot of the very the big fundamentals that, that really matter. And then the question really will be, what then? Will the United States follow through with, with some of these approaches that are, are going to be harmful to a lot of American interests, not to mention other interests in the region? So I had the joy of being in a private debate with Peter Navarro, stage private debate, not an impromptu one. We had those two uh, in March of 2017. And Peter said very clearly, we are intentionally going to be unpredictable. Um, so they are, they are doing what they said they were going to do, both privately and publicly, and you have to give them credit for that. That part of this is clear. We're, we're, we're clearly going to be unclear. Um, and, and there are advantages to that, as Bruce just suggested, as well as disadvantages, and they get to make that call. But, you know, if I'm trying to put you off balance, I still have to have a goal in mind. Right? Is my goal to knock you over? Is my goal to hurt you? Is my goal to get past you? Is my goal to get you to rethink where you're standing and what you're doing? Uh, and that's where I think the administration, not only publicly but also privately, doesn't, hasn't made up their mind. I'll give you a very concrete illustration that the subtlety is lost on most people who don't follow China. The original, and I was at the first meeting, the original 301 launch in August of 2017 was aimed at Chinese IP coercion to a lesser extent theft. Okay. Fine. I, th that is a legitimate target in my view. Um, the tariff application emphasized Made in China 2025, which is a Chinese industrial policy statement. Those are not the same thing. I mean, they're related. You know, I IP coercion is part of industrial policy, but is not the same thing. The administration has switched from its launch of the investigation to uh, to its the, the, the first statement of, of its uh, sanctions. It shifted policy. Well, that's a really big change from the Chinese side. Okay, you know, we can probably be better on IP coercion. You're not even emphasizing theft, so we'll just steal the stuff that we can't coerce anymore. But if you're going after Chinese industrial policy, which they haven't said they're doing, but they've implied it to some extent with the tariff list and how they described getting it, now that is a, that, that, that's a direct confrontation with the core of, China, of China's development model. So we went from this was going to be tough, it was going to be a big ass, it's totally justified to, it still may be justified, but now you're not going to win. Um, and when you talk to the administration in private and you say something like, all right, what if, you know, you sanction semiconductor output because of this ridiculous state fund on semiconductors, you know, and the Chinese go along with that. No, well, what about this thing and this thing and this thing? They have too many goals that they're asking for, for from the Chinese that are fundamental for this to be a realistic process. Um, and, you know, I, I take uh, Bruce's point about people coming out of the woodwork, both in the United States and elsewhere, saying, wait, 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 I, I haven't been talking up, you know, trade values and principles or whatever, but now I have to because um, a lot of change seems to be on the table. Uh, as somebody who's quite anti-China on economic policy, I still don't think the administration has a productive approach because I want to know what they're asking um, exactly, and they don't want to tell you. And I'll tell you just directly, and there are probably people here who've had the same experience, Chinese officials don't know what the U.S. is asking either. And they come in and they say, please, do you know what the U.S. is asking? I'm like, well, if I told you, it would be different tomorrow. So that really wouldn't be that, that, that helpful. So I think there's the big problem. Uh, and I don't like it as, a, as a, somebody who believes in open markets in general. I don't like the use of uncertainty as a weapon. But beyond that, the administration has said they were going to do that. They've, they've gotten some value out of it. But you have to have a goal when you're employing that uncertainty, that now we've thrown you off balance, this is what we want. And we haven't gotten to that point yet, um, and there's been plenty of opportunities. Remember, this is not April of 2017. It's April of 2018. There's plenty of opportunity for the administration to tell us what they want. They've told us what they want on NAFTA. You can disagree with it or not, but the NAFTA negotiations are a lot easier in that respect than the U.S.-China standoff. And in terms of what one hears from Chinese interlocutors on this, also in the mix as they try to sort it out is, is this an attempt to keep, keep China down in a geostrategic way and the economic levers are being used? Is it about the bilateral trade deficit, which the president sometimes makes a lot of noise about? There's a lot of, of trying to sort out what the agenda is. Uh, you know, do you want to weigh on that? Uh, yeah. okay. mm -hmm. All right. Well, then I th uh, we've got a microphone somewhere. Yes, at the back. Uh, so uh, Tatiana will come around and why don't we start here and work our way across. Uh, yes, uh, Dave, Dave Fitzgerald, retired Foreign Service. I was wondering, just to follow up on the last uh, round of, uh, of uh, Derek's and uh, Mr. Hirsch's uh, remarks, is there an absence of Asian expertise in the Trump administration a factor in this ability to um, not understand how to better or more effectively 
uh, communicate to uh, China and other Asian partners exactly what our goals are? Is it this lack of expertise or a lack of maybe just doing business in Asia, or, or are they trapped in their own ideology? Is that? I'm going to make. I'm going to personalize this answer. Um, I can imagine a situation where I have a pretty senior position in this administration, and I think incredibly highly of my Asia expertise, in case no one's noticed. Um, and I would worry that I still couldn't get anything done. Uh, you know, the, the State Department, as we know, has not functioned. And I'm hoping that Secretary-designate Pompeo um, is going to do a considerably better job. I think there's reason to think that, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, I would argue that the Treasury Department has not been functional on international economic issues to anything like the level that we want. The same thing with the Commerce Department. The White House, you've seen the personnel turnover in the White House. That makes it very difficult, even if everybody in the individual job is capable and knows what they're doing with regard to Asia or anything else. If you're gone or your deputy's gone or your counterpart is gone in eight months, it's very difficult to stick to policy. So I understand your question about Asia expertise, but I think we could eject serious Asia expertise into this administration, and not, it wouldn't necessarily make a difference. You still have to have a decision at, at or very near the presidential level, his closest advisors, about what you're trying to do and what the, you know, what the pain that you're willing to suffer to get to that goal is. And then the Asia expertise comes in on, all right, I know, I know how to work with this. But until you have that decision, and maybe it comes after NAFTA, maybe it comes with my former colleague, John Bolton, who is a strategic thinker coming to the administration, you know, there's hope for improvement. But right now, I don't think the problem has been Asia expertise. I think it's been a, 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 a chaotic, sometimes deliberately, uh, policy process that means it doesn't matter whether you know what's going on or not. You know, you're not going to be able to hold the reins of American policy for longer than a couple of days or a couple of weeks. Else, want to Bruce, you want to lay on? No, I, I, I agree. I mean, the, the policies are very much top down at this point, and uh, the opportunity for for input from experts is, is limited. Thank you very much. My name is Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency. Of Hong Kong and uh, Derek, uh, this morning I read part of your article that will be published on the AEI uh, website. Is that the, but, the one but on the But it has been okay. removed. I the, the linkage doesn't <laughs> work. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> okay. If if I understand <laughs> if I understand correctly, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if I understand correctly, uh, you mentioned that uh, the situation right now actually is different from the situation when China joined the WTO 17 years ago. So my question for you is, in the context of the increasing strategic competition between the two countries, could we see any trend of this linkage between the two countries economically? Because everybody said the interdependence of the economy between the US and China has been the stabilizing cornerstone of the general US-China relations. But in a new context, could we see a new trend that the, the this linkage will happen between the two countries in the longer term? Thank you. So uh, may I think I understand your question, and I would illustrate it this way. Um, there, is no quest there is no doubt, 100 percent true, to some, you know, the extent to which we can argue over, and maybe it shifts rapidly, but there is no doubt that the U.S. hope for China's co security cooperation over North Korea has restrained U.S. economic actions. So the old view that US, the U.S. economy, well, you know, U.S.-China economic relationship was restraining U.S.-China security conflict, that absolutely flipped around in the consideration of the 301 inquiry and North Korea. Um, I, and I would add to that, you know, that's just a specific example. I, I urge everyone, totally disagree with me, that's fine, but take seriously the idea that the challenges of the American economy lend themselves much more readily to a protectionist solution now than they did 15 years ago. Um, and people just need to understand that. They can say, look, the politics are exaggerated, and you know, okay, fine. I, I argue with my, uh, my friends, the domestic economists at AEI all the time, and they, they spit out the results of conventional trade models. Well, I mean, we're not, a, a, the United States and no, no country is at any point in time is, is, a, is a generic entity. We have seen deterioration <coughs> in certain economic indicators while sharp improvement occurs in other economic indicators, and, and trade plays into that. Uh, and so, and uh, both economically and politically. So, I think we have an example 
of the economic relationship becoming the harder relationship than the security relationship. It's only an example. But we have, we have a long-term trend in the U.S. economically. It is long-term where the U.S. It, it makes more sense. I'm not saying it makes sense. It makes more sense for the U.S. to become protectionist. We have China's rise on the technological ladder, which is not just alarm the United States. It's also alarmed the Germans, for example. That's a change. And we have, you know, to me, I don't mean to say that the WTO has no value, but I, I will at the same time say it's broken, right? I mean, you know, we, the WTO in 2002 is coming off of a round and thinking hopefully towards another round, and it, it's still moving forward, and now no one, no one has that view of the WTO. So the institutions, the bilateral relationship has changed, the U.S. economic fundamentals have changed, the institutions have changed, China has moved up the technology ladder such that Made in China 2025 is much more threatening than Made in China 2012 was. Um, so all of that has changed, and I think you're, you're right. Not that the economic relationship is turning all bad and the security relationship is all good. That's obviously not true. But we cannot count on the economic relationship dampening down strategic conflict between the U.S. and China. It may encourage the strategic conflict. Um, so I would push back a little against uh, Derek's point because he asked for it um, <laughs> and say that, you know, I, you, you look at stuff, uh, Doug Owen's latest book, Clashing Over Commerce, he gives a history of U.S. trade policy. And I think the interesting thing there is that protectionism has been part of U.S. trade policy as much as free trade has. And when you look all the way back, you kind of see the same sort of echoes of what we hear now. I don't think that a lot of what we're hearing from uh, the, the Heartland base or these, these so-called Trump supporters um, that want more protectionism is anything new. Um, I think we've always had this. Uh, it's just that we have to find ways to deal with it it differently. Uh, and sometimes we just kind of default to protectionism because it's the easiest way to deal with it rather than addressing real domestic problems through domestic solutions. Uh, so trade agreements aren't going to solve domestic inequality. If you think domestic inequality is a problem, solve it through domestic programs, uh, whichever way you see fit. The second point I'll say in terms of the WTO, um, I, I don't say it's broken. I think um, the WTO has actually functioned fairly well for the organization. The problem I agree with is the rules are outdated. And that's a huge problem that we do need to address. Uh, without any new multilateral rounds, how are we going to update this? And I think there has to be a way forward, whether we do plurilaterals um, and find a way to bring all these other countries to the table. In terms of a relationship with China, like when they enter the WTO, very different economically. They've changed. And I think it's fair to ask for more concessions from China going forward. And that negotiation should happen through sitting down and talking about it, not by enacting tariffs uh, on Chinese products. So I think there's a different way to go about it. And the administration's not doing a good job to bring China into the fold. And I think that's a huge problem. Can I briefly respond? I, I'm um, happy to lose. Control. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> I, you're such a good fit for Cato. Uh, <laughs> like, you guys can interpret that the way you want. I won't be any more explicit than Pistols that. Pistols at the coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say two things. You're not going to sit down and get the Chinese to change anything. You have to coerce them. They're not, you know, they love their industrial policies. They see it as not only successful to this point, but you know, you have an increasing Chinese debt problem. You have depleted land resources. You have a now shrinking and aging labor force. Innovation is the Chinese correctly identify as their way forward economically, and they think the way for innovation is top-down direction of innovation through massive subsidies uh, and creation of extremely high-scale, large-scale uh, enterprises. They're not going to give that up by talking. Um, so that, that's one part where we certainly disagree on. I think the second part is where we disagree, but I, I take your point. The best solution to the United America's problems are domestic. We're a large economy. Large economies you take care of your own house first, then you turn to your trade partners. Small economies have to think about trade first. We don't. But we've just seen um, we, have, we have an established U.S. inability under Republicans and Democrats to think about education for the long term to improve the competitiveness of our labor force. We can talk about it as much as we like. It never happens. And then with regard to this administration in particular, they chose a tax reform cut that is going to have – Certain implications for U.S. competitiveness that are positive, but in my opinion, is not going to is certainly not, in my opinion, going to help with wealth inequality, and I don't think it's going to help with labor force participation. So the you know you can say, well, I wish we had a better tax program. And in fact, the House proposed a better tax program before Speaker Ryan completely abandoned it. Um, but what we have on the table is not going to solve those problems. Which means, in the medium term, not just the next six months, but the next three or four years, we're stuck with the domestic environment we have and the 
and, and the economic challenges that we have where we have 40-year lows in labor force participation aren't going to be addressed by domestic actions, even though I agree with you that would be the right response, that puts a lot of pressure on trade policy. So I don't think we disagree there. I'm just saying, I'm, you know, in the, in the world we have now, trade policy is under a lot of pressure because we have not taken the steps to make ourselves more competitive. Um, you know, this is on, the, on sort of the edge of the topic here, but uh, just to go back to the, the WTO issue and, and its relevance, um, you know, yes, at the moment, uh, the ability of the organization to come up with new rules, at least new rules through a, a large round um, is just can't, is not there. Um, but I think it's important to put it all into context. Uh, you know, there were periods uh, of, the GATS, of the WTO's predecessor, the GATT, where not a whole lot happened. And, um, you know, during those periods, uh, there was a retrenchment, there was a, a taking stock of what might come next, and th there was also, frankly, a building of pressure for action at the organization. Um, I had the, the, the privilege of working on the trade facilitation negotiations, and that succeeded, and it succeeded even just in the last few years. So, the, you know, there is at least the model and there's an example of uh, an opportunity to succeed when there's a consensus to do so, when there really is broad support. So, you know, w there's going to need to be some time to percolate for topics uh, to, to come up that uh, a recognition on a broad swath of the membership that those topics really are important and of use to them. And then there's the issue that you know, uh, 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 highlighted of uh, the, the emerging economies um, realizing that they do have a role to play here if this is going to succeed. And um, it's qu it'll be quite interesting to watch whether in light of the current pressures and in light of the, the current developments with the U.S. approach, whether there is that recognition on the part of uh, some of the major players, the Chinas, the Brazils, the Indias, the countries that, that did bring down the round, that maybe um, the criticisms were correct and, and that they really do need to step up. And should all that happen, and I'm not giving a date for that, <laughs> um, you know, then you know, the opportunity for the WTO to actually step up is there. Um, you know, I, I might point out that um, 20 or 30 years ago, nobody would have predicted that at this point Japan uh, would be playing the kind of leadership role that they are on these issues, um, especially in, you know, in the Asia region, especially in the context of uh, the TPP, but not only. So um, there is, um, you know, at least precedent for uh, change, even if it's a long-term matter. Thank you. Uh, Nadia Chao with the Liberty Times, Taiwan. Uh, I have a question for Derek, but also for other panelists. Uh, even though you just said, you know, nobody know what's the Trump's, you know, goal for its trade policy. I still want to be the dead horse a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, after- My job now, apparently. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, uh, if for Taiwan as a partner of the U.S., it's a kind of confusing right now. Is the Trump administration going after the overcapacity of a China? Or is it tackling the supply chain of China? Or it want to have the upper hand of the technology lead? Because Taiwan is a part of the, you know, uh, global supply chain has a very integrated uh, economic relationship with China. So um, for your partner, and then they're trying to figure out, you know, what Trump is going after. Uh, so, wonder if you and other panelists can give us some idea. Thank you. Uh, you know, that's the, there's there's three possibilities. Of course, there are others. Is it that they don't like trans-Pacific supply chains? Is they just don't like in, you know in overcapacity, which is focused in one country in terms of both the extent of it and the size of the economy, which is China? Or is this a technology cold war, which people are bringing up, uh, which I would respectfully say started some years ago, did not start um, recently. Uh, and then, you know, you have the trade deficit, you have the, which I think is a, a perfectly good, the course is a, is a good illustration, throw the United States a few industrial bones and then, you know, the president will declare victory. You have other possibilities as well. Um, I would dis distinguish between the short term and the long term. In the short term, I don't know what the goal is. And uh, look, I, I, I don't want to exaggerate my contact with the administration, but I've had a close, you know, a private session where I said, what is your goal? And I did not get an answer. And then someone else who is very close to the administration, much closer than me, said, what is your goal? And we still didn't get an answer. Um, now, the individual responding has a goal, but he did not want to speak for the administration because I don't think the administration as a whole has one. I, I will say in the longer term, I, I think I, I tried to hit at it in my, in my remarks, the U.S., in my opinion, for the next 
at least three years, maybe longer, but certainly at least three years, is going to move in a protectionist direction. Um, and what you're going to want to do, you know, for Taiwan or other countries in this situation is look to, I hope, the NAFTA model, because that's the heart, that's the big test, as, as we've said. The, uh, and, and if you can't look at it, then, you know, the Korea model to the extent that that's applicable, but Korea is in a security situation that most countries are not in. So it's not, Korea is not that helpful. NAFTA would be more helpful. And say, all right, I, I get a sense of what the administration wants. At least I can, I have an option if we get put into their sights. And you might think, well, I'm acting like this is a random event, but un un until we see a long-term strategy, it is a random event. If we see NAFTA, then we know what administration economic goals are. We'll get, it will be much easier for Ambassador Lighthizer to talk about what his next task is. Um, if we don't see NAFTA, you're guessing, and I, I don't know what else to tell you. Um, from this particular Taiwanese perspective, I would have uh, 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 and a pr proposal ready for the United States when you get a sign the United States either wants to talk, which would be post-NAFTA, or you're feeling a threat is coming down at you either directly or aimed at China. So if the, if the U.S.-China trade relationship spirals downward and it's going to impact Taiwan, Taiwan should be looking for some sort of exemption uh, to, to various new U.S. rules uh, or a, a, a slow phase in of some of them. And that Congress, would, as you know, would be very supportive of that. Um, but it requires Taiwan to be ready, not, not to just hope that the U.S. will tell them what we're, what we're going to do, because other than implicitly in the NAFTA provisions, I don't see any sign of that. Um, and I don't think the situation is going to get better next year. It's certainly not going to get better during the U.S. election year. I don't – I'll just – sorry, I'm taking too long to answer this question, but uh, I, something to add, I don't see who's going to run as a free trader in 2020 uh, on either side. So I think the rhetoric we're going to hear and the response from the Trump administration defending itself against criticism, because the U.S. trade deficit very well might be larger, um, is going to make things worse. I think the situation is going to get worse before it gets better, and Taiwan needs to be prepared for contingencies, either positive in the case of a NAFTA completion or negative in the case of a U.S. attack on the supply chains, where it's whether it's deliberate or not. Um, okay, there and then there. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Chris McRae. So I'm mindful that in December 2016, Kissinger went both to go and talk to Xi Jinping and then to Trump. And basically he told them, because he also briefed a uh, session that I attended, basically not, not to start a trade war over the future of young people's jobs, which may be Maybe if you looked at you know, the next three billion jobs, only half a billion of them are the ones you're talking about. Uh, two and a half billion are to do with technology, of education, of better health service, of local things, of going green. Uh, I, I'm worried to death that you are arguing with China over things which are maybe the old jobs and not looking at some of the things which could be win-wins. I mean, one example just to challenge Derek is this year, China had five million startups. It's a bit like the dot-coms were 20 years ago in the US. But hopefully they may be our more intelligent, small enterprise things going on in the community. So it's not just technolo uh, a technology war you, you know, at the big level. It, it, it's what's going to go on in communities and, and with youth and with learning in sectors where I, I don't really, under, I, I would like you to clarify, uh, you, you know, how your prescriptions relate to those. My prescriptions? No, it's an absolutely fair criticism of the U.S. to say we're looking backward. I think you mentioned returning to the 1980s. Um, I, I use, when I talk about the president's position, a link of him on Oprah from the 1980s, talking about Japan exactly the same way he talks about China. And the AFL-CIO does the same thing. I mean, he's not alone in this. The Trump campaign usually used most labor pressure groups for their, for their, tr for their trade statements. Um, so this is a long-term issue, and we are looking back at uh, uh, you know, older industries. Uh, I think there is an economic and political justification for it insofar as those are the people who are suffering most in the country. Um, you, you know, talking about, well, let's talk about the future. Well, we have problems at present, and when you're in, pol at, at, in, in the present, and when you're in politics, um, you need to address those problems, or at least uh, seem to be addressing those problems. Uh, I think, you know, so, so I, I take your point, 
that we're arguing more about past injustices or losses or whatever than we, than we are thinking about the future. But those, those past events have led to the situation of higher concentration of U.S. wealth, in part, and, and lower U.S. labor force participation. It would be great if we had brilliant domestic policy to solve those, but we don't, and we haven't for a long time. So that, I understand why trade is looking backward, because it's backward where some of the problems in U.S. manufacturing um, and in U.S. manufacturing employment have come from. With regard to, to win-win with the Chinese, this is where you know I, I become sort of more, even worse than normal. I don't believe that's possible. The Chinese are not negotiating. I mean, their their goal of th those startups are for China. They protect Chinese IP, not foreign IP, and so on. So that's not that's not a, a, a route, route I would take. Just one example: the metro we have here is not very good. Mm -hmm. If you look at metros in Tokyo or China, mm -hmm. they are more sensibly designed. Yes. We could learn from that. Well, so let's like it. It's very. I, I study Chinese construction and investment overseas. I know the major Chinese companies in this area really, really well, uh, and they could contribute to U.S. infrastructure rebuilding. There's that's true. So you might think, well, why can't we agree on that? Well, the answer is. Um, why would we reward the Chinese for their behavior to this point by, you know, having them participate in, in, in our model, which is for-profit, uh, uh, for-profit U.S. infrastructure build, number one. That's my answer. But the other answer is we can't get the infrastructure program through Congress. So, again, I mean, in a world where all of our domestic policy options are on the table, we have a different relationship with China. But in this world, we don't have that relationship. I just said well, I think there's one, there's one piece of the story to make, uh, mm -hmm. respond to your question, but which we haven't been focused on. So, I mean, I, and I agree with a lot of what Derek has to say, that, that China's agenda for innovation economy and so on, is, it's, a, it's very heavy-handed industrial planning and all of that. But a lot of the tech stuff, and I think we'll hear about this on the next uh, panel in, in some detail, is outside of that framework. It, a lot of it is percolating up, uh, despite all the... Um, all the uh, concern about intellectual property, coerced transfer, and all that. There's a lot of stuff that's being created on both sides of the Pacific. There's a lot of back and forth. And so while we're in a moment where American business is no longer the friend of China and openness in U.S.-China relationships that it once was, I worry about oversteering the story too much in the other direction. There, there is that other layer to it, too. But um, that's a partial disagreement. No, we could oversteer, no question. Right there and then there. Hi, um, Chia from United Day News Taiwan. Um, question for Derek. I just want to follow up because you mentioned that Taiwan has to be ready. And whenever the U.S. wants to talk, what specifics should be in the proposal? Uh, I, I guess I've talked too much, even though I've told you over and over again. I don't know what the U.S. wants. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that gets back to Nadia's where, where U.S. policy goes. If you have this guidance from a NAFTA agreement, Everyone should be able to look at that agreement and gain a sense of, you know, what the U.S. is looking for, what is uh, acceptable to Taiwan, what is unacceptable to Taiwan. If you don't have the guidance, you know, Taiwan is obsessed with South Korea, so you could look at Chorus and try to get some guidance that way. But it, it, it de it'll depend in the Taiwanese case mostly on the nature of the U.S. confrontation, economic confrontation with China. I mean, are we just trying to reduce the trade deficit? Are we just looking for some industrial policy handouts, in which case, you know, that won't bother, that won't matter to Taiwan? Um, the administration has been very clear. They know if they force down the U.S.-China trade deficit, it's just going to lead to production moving to other countries, not the United States. They don't, they don't claim, you know, the president does, but the administration officials don't claim millions of jobs are going to come if we force production out of China. Um, so if they go after supply chains for that reason, that's, that's a different response. Um, I, I just don't know how to answer your question until I see a more coherent American policy. Um, if the policy is really going to be we're going to keep raising tariffs and raising tariffs and keep them in place until the Chinese give us something. Um, then you know Taiwan's stuck because there's there's not going to be any escape route there um, if if the U.S. applies tariffs to a wider and wider range of goods. I don't think that's going to be the case. Uh, I think we'll come up to some some other sort of settlement. But I don't I don't know whether um, the target you know what what the top priority is. I, I do know that if if Taiwan there's an unavoidable challenge here, which I've talked about, you guys probably heard me talk about it before with regard to Taiwan, is if, if Taiwan cannot find partners other than China, it's taken an enormous risk, and now the risk is coming into play. So no matter what the U.S. does, 
one thing Taiwan should be doing is what it talks about doing, which is economic diversification. Um, and, and since I think this is a multi-year process, there is time to advance that economic diversification. Maybe Taiwan's ask of the U.S. should be to broker arrangements with other countries because, you know, they don't want to recognize Taiwan as an independent country they're negotiating with. So we can do it in, in, in three-way talks. That's unusual, but it, it might be more feasible, and that might be something the U.S. can do for Taiwan that doesn't interfere with whatever we're trying to do with regard to China. But I can't tell you what Taiwan is supposed to do because I don't know – what the U.S. angle is, um, you know, and that, that's for other countries, the EU can uh, have strategies independent of what the U.S. is trying to accomplish with China, but Taiwan can't, and we don't know what that is, so I, I can't add nothing to offer. Sorry. <laughs> and, and diversification is tough. I mean, China, China gets in the way of free trade agreements with right. other countries in the region, and uh, you know, new southbound policy, all these things, it's the ever-receding goal. So there, there's somebody who made a, a pitch to the administration that they should, they should do trilaterals in Asia, and they should just dump Taiwan into all the trilaterals. Mm -hmm. um, and though, so, like, it's not really more than a bilateral because Taiwan only has 23 million people, so you don't have to worry about that. I mean, that, uh, that might actually play out as possible over time once we're clear of NAFTA, because we really don't know what U.S. trade priorities are until we're done with NAFTA. Well, the U.S. is talking about the number one country we've mentioned, and I'm not saying this is reasonable. I'm just saying the number one country we've mentioned in a bilateral in Asia is the Philippines. Um, now, of course, that's because they weren't in TPP, and TPP is the worst agreement of all time, except when it isn't. Um, so we might be willing to go back, but uh, you know, if we talk to the Philippines, why wouldn't we talk to Vietnam? I don't know. But that's the, no, that's the country that gets mentioned the most. Yeah, we have another a question I want to get to there, but uh, just, just a, in the flow here. Um, so, um, Bruce, you, you talked about Japan stepping in to play a, a, a role that obviously the U.S. had a TPP. How far does that go? How far can Japan go in, in carrying some of the water or some of the weight of, of sustaining liberalization, economic integration in the region? It's not a traditional role in many ways. Um, do you see much prospect there? Well, I mean, you know, the, to the extent that they continue to push for others to join the TPP, then they can continue in that context. Um, you know, beyond that, I, I'm not really sure. Um, you know, they've got bilaterals with, 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 with many already. Uh, but, um, you know, it's perhaps in that context that they could really continue to uh, make an impact. Okay, we've got the next question there. You have a question here. Wait, wait for the microphone a second. Thank you. Let me ask a question in two ways. One is, <coughs> given uh, Trump's uh, articulated goals of reducing the trade deficit and increasing uh, American labor uh, participation, and secondly, the uh, way the negotiations are going, as you say, uncertainty, uncertainty is the goal. Uh, uh, whether you agree with it or not, what, uh, what is the tactic that, or the goal that uh, the administration could achieve uh, based on these tactics and this environment? Is there one, or are they just uh, spinning their wheels? Uh, it depends on your time frame. I mean, I think you're going to have some views of this, too. Uh, I think. A cur you know, chorus two with the Chinese, where the Chinese give us like three concessions, and we say, "Look, we got the best deal ever. No one else could have gotten that. Only me, with my you know threats and un my uncertainty, could have gotten it." Um, the problem for the Trump administration is the U.S. economy is so big, you really can't have minor trade adjustments that make any difference. So in 2020, whatever victory we get in that respect, where we if it's chorus two like, it goes away. Um, uh, the administration is aware of this. They've asked for the Chinese to guarantee a reduction of the trade deficit, and then there was negotiations over size uh, of that, and uh, apparently the negotiations didn't go, didn't go very well when Leo Ho was here. Um, you c it's very hard to manage from the American side. The Chinese can manage a trade deficit reduction on their side. It's us that can't manage it, right? I mean, if the president is right that the corporate tax cut is going to boost U.S. demand, and there's an accounting issue here, which is actually fairly important. But just holding everything else constant, we would expect the U.S. trade deficit to rise. So if the Chinese are, are guaranteeing $100 billion of purchases over three years, um, that might get washed out and the trade deficit might rise anyway because of increasing U.S. demand. And that puts the president in a very, very difficult position politically in 2020. So if the U.S. is looking for a chorus two, we can do it, but it won't accomplish very much. If we're looking for a fixed change in the trade deficit, honestly, the stronger the U.S. economy is, the better it is for the United States. But the, the trade deficit, you know, 
achievement in quotes won't won't last at all. Um, and I, you know, if we're actually like looking to to push China off of its industrial policy in a meaningful way, that's really a seven eight year process, not a first term process. Yeah, I would say. Um, you know, when you look at the administration's goals, um, they're really at odds with the approach here. And I agree with Derek in the sense that, uh, you know, doing another course is not going to get us uh, where the administration wants to go. Um, and so we need to look at the bigger deals. Unfortunately, we're out of TPP, so that's gone. Um, that was a bad idea. Um, so we should have stayed in it or tried to find a way back in it. Um, it's not clear how that would even happen at this point because, you know, the, the administration is saying that the other TPP countries has to give us something yeah. enticing um, mm -hmm. for us to come back yeah. in. Um, and it's not clear to me that they can actually <laughs> – <laughs> <laughs> they can actually give us something uh, in return. So there's that. Uh, but then also TTIP, uh, you know, whether the administration is going to be honest in their approach to TTIP, the EU is not going to be bullied um, like the Koreans. The, you know, the, everything is different there in terms of the scope of negotiations, what's at stake, and the relationship. Um, and then there's the WTO. The administration is not going to make any effort to launch a new round at the WTO. And that would be the best way to get the biggest concessions and to have the most market opening. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. So unless they want to take an honest approach uh, towards actually big liberalization, I don't think so. Because um, all of the asks are very protectionist. And so if you're going to go to TTIP, I, what are you going to get out of TTIP at this point? It's not going to be the Obama model. It'll be something else. So I think we have some big challenges ahead. No, no, I don't. Oh, I, I mean, I, I can see a favorable end game if they're willing to pay a much steeper price than they've indicated so far. I mean, I look at Larry Kudlow's trying to reassure the markets, oh, I don't think we'll ever have these tariffs, I don't think they'll ever have these tariffs. Well, then you're not going to get anything from the Chinese. I mean, I say that as somebody who is fairly supportive of the administration in principle, but you're only going to get big changes from trade, because the U.S. economy is so big, from big shifts in the trade relationship with major partners. And those don't come from snapping your fingers or even waving a big club and say, you know, be careful, I might use this. Oh, there's something shiny over there. I'll be, get back to you. Um, so, you know, I think there's a favorable end game from America, the United States standpoint. It may not be from the region standpoint or from the global economy standpoint, but that requires multiple years of a sustained policy where we know what we're doing and we stick to it regardless of angry ag state senators or whatever. And I don't, I don't see any sign the administration doing that. I see them either taking something they find unsatisfactory a couple of years from now, um, or we get the, this, this uh, unintended deterioration um, where the U.S. has got become more protectionist and global trade is restricted, but we don't really gain from it. Bruce, any last words? Um, nope. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, we, we've uh, run a bit uh, over time, and I'm sure we could keep uh, going, uh, but let me uh, call this panel to a halt since we are a bit past our, our stopping time, and thank uh, Inu, Derek, and Bruce. Thank you for a terrific panel. Thank you all for your questions, uh, and there's a brief coffee break outside. Is that right? We'll come back at 2.35 for the next panel. All right, thank you.